It is now my pleasure to introduce Dan Mayer um, for this particular wave. He is the executive director at Region 5 BOCES, which includes Sunrise School, Hayden Peak Academy, Roosevelt Learning Center, CV Branch, and statewide outreach services. Dan is a nationally certified school psychologist and holds a principalship certificate from the University of Wyoming. His undergraduate training includes a double major in special education for the deaf and elementary education, which provided him with a strong background in psychology, special education, general education, audiology, and child development. Dan has been established, has established longstanding relationships within the education community. He was a special education director, coordinating programming for Uinta County School District Number Four in Mountain View, and Uinta County School District Number One in Evanston. Prior to joining Region 5 BOCES, Dan taught general psychology at Western Wyoming College in Rock Springs and Eastern Wyoming College in Douglas. So Dan, welcome and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Tom. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover today and like Tom was saying, um, if you have questions or any comments, please put them in the chat and um, I will stop to answer those questions. Um, the presentation today is a lengthy one and I need to get my screen to be able to move. I, there's 150 or 160 slides that I have presented. I will be going through some information more quickly and I will stop on others. At any point that we wanna stop and really dive deeper into a certain concept or a test, please just let me know and we be I would be happy to do that. I will not cover all the slides in depth. However, as Tom mentioned, you will be getting the slide deck and it has all the information that you need. I will be going through the Woodcock Johnson, um, not in sequential order, like test one, test two, test three. I've broken it up into reading, math and writing. Um, I will cover interpretation after reading and writing. And if we get time, if we get through everything, there's some more interpretation that I wanted to add to, or if our dialogue really wanted to move us to more talking about what these scores mean. Um, so that's how the presentation is developed. And um, again, I, I open your, your questions, your comments, and uh, I'll get into why I decided to do this presentation this way. So my, the objectives today, I have two primary objectives. One um, is to increase participants' understanding of the procedures and best practices for the administration of the Woodcock-Johnson Four. That objective is very important because when we start looking at test numbers, standard scores, those results making educational decisions for kids, we wanna make sure the numbers that we're looking at and interpreting and making decisions on are accurate. And a lot of times we, or in the presentations or the work that I've been in, we oftentimes talk about the clinical interpretation of scores and we don't talk about what it takes to get those scores. And I feel like there's a lot of information that can be gained by administering, understanding, and seeing how kids respond to these different basic reading tests, um, word attack, the different subtests of the Woodcock-Johnson. It's not just about the numbers and we'll get into that. So that's why I really wanna go through and, and really some of these tests are really easy to administer and some of them are a little bit more complex. So the easier ones we'll go through because I think if, we've, if you have a good understanding or you've administered this before, it'll help. But some of them can be a little bit more tricky to administer or maybe not understanding. And that's what we're here to do today to answer those questions and clarify that. I think it's always a good reminder to make sure that we're getting good test results. Second, um, I really wanna increase your knowledge of interpretation of the Woodcock-Johnson Four, and to really think about what instructional modifications and identify effective strategies that you can identify by using this test instrument. Oftentimes in my experience, I see test results, we administer them, we have this, we find the child eligible, and then we start making decisions about the IEP and services absent of some of these test scores. And I really would encourage, there's a lot of good information in these test scores if we learn to understand what they're telling us. And that's what I want to do. I think it's, it's not something you'll walk away 
from just saying, hey, I understand this completely. But I think if we can slowly try to gain an understanding of really understand what these tests are trying to measure, I think it can really help us find those modifications and those effective strategies. So those are my two primary um, goals for this, objectives for this presentation. A little bit about interpretation before we begin. I want to start with this because I want to get your minds thinking about it in a, maybe a different way that you haven't thought about it. Because we, we, we say this often, but I don't see it always done in practice. But this is um, Mr. Woodcock, one of the co-authors of the Woodcock-Johnson. And when he was developing the Woodcock-Johnson years ago, um, the primary purpose for the test was to, he believes we should be finding out more about the problem, not just to get a score. And I see teams oftentimes just getting a score and they're not taking it there. And I'm here to tell you, I was telling Gail, if you came on a little bit earlier and were listening, this presentation or the slide deck that I originally, I was working from, which when they asked me to do this is like 300 and some slides long. And I'm really have pared it down. This could really go into two, three days of discussion the depth that you can go into the Woodcock Johnson to look at, especially as from an academic perspective, to really help you understand the child and start developing some, like I said, modifications, accommodations, and some strategies for the child. So again, my goal is not just to get that test score, but I, and I'm not even going to talk that much about scores today. If we talk about scores, we're going to talk about that RPI score, um, that one score that seems really it's the only place you can find it is on the Woodcock Johnson or the Woodcock Johnson testing materials. And if we get time, I'd like to explore that a little bit more. Um, but I'm not even gonna really get into test scores today um, because I really wanna spend time on um, all of that other stuff. So just a little bit about the organization of the Woodcock Johnson real briefly. Um, there are different forms of the test. Did I click, pardon me a second, I keep hitting it. There we go. There's three forms of the standard battery. Um, there's achievement A, achievement B, and achievement C. That is built so you can give this test, you know, more than once in a calendar year. There are some places that use it for pre-test and post-test results. People have done that. So it used to be there was a form A and a form B, but actually the new Woodcock Johnson actually has three different forms. And so that really allows a lot of flexibility to be, and they're co-normed on each other. So there you can do comparative analysis between those subtests if you choose to do that. And there's a lot of reasons people may look into using those different achievement batteries. Um, one thing to note, the one form, um, the extension of it is, there's only one form of the extension of the battery. Um, so A, B, and C, and that's the second. So you don't give that. But for the more core content items, there are three forms of the standard. There's really just one form of the extended battery that can be given. Um, the three forms, um, forms A, B, C, that's test one through 11. The extended is 12 through 20. Um, you use that with all three forms. The core set of tests are tests one through six. It measures real basically reading, writing, and math achievement areas, creates intra-achievement variation procedures. And there's a brief achievement cluster that's test one through three. And we're gonna go through how it's formed a little bit more. But in all, there's 20 tests, 11 in the standard, nine in the extended. The three forms have different, three different versions of those 11 tests in the standard. And with all of that, those subtests, it creates 22 clusters. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about those clusters and how they're developed. The achievement test, this has been out for a while now. People probably know there are some new and extended tests that really want to get into that oral reading, reading recall, word reading, fluency. So a lot more fluency. They really expanded on the fluency. They have number matrices that help in the math. And they separated out the science, social studies, and humanities section. It used to be just, I can't even remember what the subtest was called anymore, but it used to be clustered together. And now they're separated out. So you can see those scores and standard scores separately, which created also some new clusters. You have a reading cluster now, you have a comprehension cluster. And these clusters are important because when we look at 
Um, for example, one good example of clusters is when we look at learning disabilities, for example, we're not, when you look at Appendix A of the Wyoming rules for identifying learning disabilities and you use an ability achievement discrepancy, you're not supposed to be, you, you are not to use one single subtest to compare, to, to identify a student with a, with a learning disability. We should be basing it on clusters of scores. And it says that right in our rules and it's just best practice because we don't want to base any large educational decision on just one subtest of scores. We wanna see trends. We wanna see evidence that what we're getting is consistent. It should never be based on one item or one test. If one test says there's a problem, we ought to be looking a little bit deeper. But that helps that interpretation. They cluster these scores into areas that are identified as comprehension, um, reading skills, and that sort of thing. It's also co-normed with the Woodcock-Johnson test of cognitive abilities and a new test of oral language. So there's actually three tests. You have cognitive abilities, which mimics what the the WISC will do the IQ test with so a bit of an IQ test. It's not considered an IQ test, but it gives an ability index. Um, the achievement scores are really the reading, writing, and math. And we're gonna talk about that today. And then there's a test of oral language. And again, oral language is very important when we talk about academics because a lot of school is about listening, hearing, talking, understanding. Um, reading, writing, it's all variations of oral language. So understanding a child's oral language is very important, especially early on when we're first testing a kid um, to understand where those oral language abilities are. Because if they're oral language, we were always taught that someone cannot comprehend what they read more than what they can read if they just listen. So you should always look, think about oral comprehension in reading versus what they can listen and comprehend. They shouldn't be able to listen and comprehend. They shouldn't be able to read and comprehend more they can listen and comprehend. And so that's just an example of where these oral language skills are really important. They've created some qualitative um, observation checklists. It's located in the test record. You're probably, it just helps you look at more of that qualitative. How are they answering questions? What are they missing? Did they answer questions easily? Did they struggle right away? It just helps you to get all that. Um, and it includes the data on percentage of age mates at each rating. So it even helps you to try to quantify what you're seeing. Um, achievement standard battery, tests one through 11. This is where we're gonna wanna spend a lot of our time. I really wanna start with reading because these are where a lot of the core academic tasks are located. Um, I'm gonna move away from this testing the achievement standard battery so you can see how the Woodcock Johnson. I don't wanna do that comparative analysis. It's there for you to look at. The extended battery, these are the tests. As I was mentioning, these used to be a combination of academic skills and they've separated them out. I think that's a good thing. So each of these generate their own standard score now. So you can have a general understanding of that. And if we get to that point of the presentation, I can tell you why that's important. Um, but these are the extended um, items. This was moved. This used to be in the cognitive. It was just moved to the academic because it weighs on the academic and math so much. Kids understanding spatial relationship and moving things and seeing patterns is really related to their math ability. So it was moved over there. And like I said, reading recall for comprehension and word reading fluency, we're finding out that that's such a big measure of a student's reading. So they've added it to the Woodcock Johnson. As our knowledge about reading, math, and writing, that's why these tests change over time because we understand more and we start adding more tests to be able to quantify what we're seeing um, through instruction. Um, the extended battery, some changes. This is the slide, this is in your manual. I was gonna grab my manual in case there was questions and I forgot that this morning. But this is something that's in your interpret technical manual. Um, it's the selective testing table. And I, I've, I've been, I feel like it's important to talk about this because a lot of people I've found don't know that this exists. But what this does, you can see these are the different achievement tests on this side of it. So you can look, these are the different tests. And these are the different clusters that they create. 
So you can see to get the reading cluster, I need to administer letter word ID and passage comp. I'll get that cluster scores. But if you look across the top here, basic reading skills. So the five academic areas that you could identify in, in um, for a learning disability in Wyoming is basic reading skills, reading comprehension, reading fluency, math calculation skills, math reasoning, which could be synonymous with math problem solving. It might even be math problem solving. I don't do this as frequently as I used to. And we have written expression. And I would suggest, and I know that the oral language component has oral expression and listening comprehension clusters that are in the oral language. So you have all seven of those areas that are identified by Wyoming rules that are created in clusters in the Woodcock Johnson. So they help you provide that. So you can go through, this tool can be very useful in helping select tests if you have a student who just has a math disability and you really want to tap into that and you want to get clusters, you can use this grid to really select to get certain tests, to get certain measurements, to help you with those clusters. That's where this becomes very helpful, that these are all the different clusters and this is how they're made up. So it's important to understand where these scores are all being generated from when you get these clusters and they're created from the two subtests. So let's just take a look, just for example, basic reading skills, which we'll get into this, is letter word ID, reading words, and word attack, being able to sound out words. That's what they identify as basic reading skills. To think about it, if you would look at the Wyatt or the KABC and other tests, they may have a different variation on how they interpret it. So it's important to know that not all reading tests, not all math tests are built the same. The test puzzle, so it's important to understand how they interpret what reading is and how they're measuring it. Because not every test does it exactly the same. Anymore, I can tell you, even on the Wyatt, I think the Wyatt 4 just came out, they're gonna have a test like Word ID and Word Attack. I think that is pretty common knowledge in test and measurement for the Woodcock Johnson KABC that that's a good measure of basic reading skills. So you're not gonna see that. When it gets a little bit more tricky, I know that reading comprehension is, is different on the Wyatt than it is on the Woodcock Johnson. I don't wanna dive into those differences and which is better and which is worse. Know that there's a difference and it's important. That's why it's important to understand what the subtests actually are measuring. Reading includes eight measure, test measuring various aspects of reading. Um, letter word ID, passage comp, word attack, oral lang oral reading, excuse me, that's new. Sentence reading fluency, if you've administered this, that's a test that's been around. Reading recall, reading fluency, and reading vocabulary. So they have now eight tests to measure reading, which I think is wonderful. The Woodcock Johnson has a lot of tests. And if you give a lot of these, I think you can really make some conclusions on where the student's reading is, depending on how they did on each of these assessments. Um, and they added three new ones, which really talked about how they recall when they read and oral reading, um, just to see how they are reading. Because one of the knocks I, I felt like on Woodcock Johnson 3, we didn't ask kids just to read passages. It was always really broken up and kids sometimes would do better because the task was so broken down that they had those skills in isolation, but could they put it all together in oral reading? And so that was a nice move on their part to put these more fluency and oral reading measures out there. It provides seven clusters of reading, reading broad, reading basic reading skills, um, reading comprehension and extended. That's new. We had comprehension before and reading flint. Fluency and reading rate if you choose to administer those. So now I'm going to get into the each test that makes up the reading and go into the interpretation. Letter word ID is a very basic reading skill. Um, you select the starting point based on the examinee's estimated achievement level. So you can determine that. I think a lot of people feel like you have to go by their grade level, but you can estimate. For example, the other day, I had a student who I know was lower in reading skills and I chose to start them a little bit lower on some lower items. Even though they were a fourth grader, I chose to go down to the starting point 
at a first or second grader, just to make sure the child had some success. I didn't want to start them in such hard items. So you can select that starting point based upon what you know about that student's estimated achievement level, not their actual grade level. Those estimated starting points are just suggestions. You can do that wherever you like. I caution you if you start, I knew a teacher one time who started kids really low all the time because they weren't sure. And the, tire, the student would get fatigued. Their students would start, they'd have to test over multiple sessions because they were just administering so many items. Starting points in the middle of the testing helps you so you don't have to administer everything, right? We don't wanna start at item one and do basic word sounds with a high school student. We can probably suggest they might know some of those and they know some basic reading of some very basic words. So that's what those for. Test by complete pages, base, basal and ceiling rules. It's the six highest lowest correct or item one. So the basals and ceilings, the highest incorrect or last item is the ceiling. The words must be read fluently to receive credit, pronounced as a whole world on the last attempt. So they can make those attempts, but on their last attempt, it needs to be read as a whole word. It cannot be broken up or them sounding out in a broken way. It needs to be fluently read. They can sound it out and, and go through it because they can try to figure it out. But the final attempt needs to be a, a fluently read version of that. Early items are letter recognition and require a, a pointing response. So you just say, hey, what is this? So it's pretty basic. Naming letters requires an oral response. So this is really good for very young students. Word recognition requires pointing. So which word, point to the word that is car. So then they have to go through and select, can they identify it without having, can they identify that? Then letter word ID, the final task is now just finally reading words aloud. Words increase with difficulty. So the, at, and, and then a lot of words that I have to use the uh, tertiary. I know that one, but I have to use, and they have the, uh, the pronunciation guide with this. So make sure when you're testing an older kid, you go through and you understand how these words are pronounced as you go through. Um, we, this is the new part, the qualitative observations. You can go through on letter word, which is the following describes the ease with which the individual identified words mark only one response. So with, were they able to not apply this? So what, what were they able to do? And then when you have that one response, they'll compare it to how other kids their age did that as well. And that's where they're generating that number. Again, we want to use quantitative and qualitative observations, which when we talk a little bit more in the interpretation, we'll understand why that's important. It's not only important to know they got these items, but how were they? It's important to understand, did they, were they able to get the easier items? Where's that breakdown? Because you're trying to put all these pieces of the puzzle together to make sense of how the student is um, making sense of this. So here's a little bit more about the qualitative observations. So they collected the data and the standardization to determine the percentage of age mates assigned each rating. So example, at age nine, 4% have identified words rapidly and accurately. That's rating ones. So 4% could do that. 7% um, had a non-automatic word reading skills, rating four. And 1% did not apply phoneme and grapheme skills, rating five. But 75% were rated as typical at rating two. So that's really important through letter word ID, how people saw that. If a child, um, so at age nine, it's not an expectation that children identified words rapidly and accurate through all of it. That was a rare thing at age nine because they're just developing these skills and more complex words to read. But they typically can kind of go through. If they cannot identify or apply phoneme and graphene, less 1% did not apply that. That's a low percentage of kids that were in the standardization sample who could not do that. So at age nine, that tells me they should be able to do that. And if they're not able to do that, that's a low percentage of all kids that were really assessed. And I would assume they probably had a low standard score. So the percentage of kids who weren't able to do that was a low percentage and their standard score, I would assume would probably be, would be showing that there was a deficit in that areas. You want to use that to determine how typical or atypical an examinee's performance is on the task. 
It just helps you. How did other kids do on this that were about the same age? Just helps with that understanding of how that child's doing. So I'll take a breath. Letter word ID is pretty, pretty easy test to administer. It's one of the ones that are pretty basic. Um, moving on to test four, passage comprehension. This measures reading comprehension that contributes to five clusters, the reading cluster, broad reading, reading comp, academic applications, and broad achievements. So it's a big test that it goes across a lot of clusters across the Woodcock-Johnson. Again, the starting point is based upon examinee's estimated achievement level. We talked about that. Basal and seedling rules, test by complete pages. So the basal is the sixth lowest correct. Um, so, or item one. So if you start with item one and you weren't able to get six lowest, the child really had no identified basal. If you start with item 14 and they were able to get 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 correct, you would box that. That means they created a basal and you don't have to test anything before that. Ceilings, you wanna get the six highest incorrect or you reach the last item. And you test by complete pages, which means you wanna complete the entire page before you do that. It's all in an effort to have students not identify when they're struggling or that. We don't want kids to be influenced by failure or not doing well. A lot of kids, when I evaluate them, they're very concerned if they're not doing well on my test, which tells me they're very cognizant when they're not doing good. And then that can really impact their performance on those tests. So very important to identify those basils and those ceilings to make sure that helps us not over test a kid because we don't want to start kids on test one. But that basil and that ceiling ensures when they miss when they get six in a row, wherever that's bracketed, we can assume that all the other items they can do. And then again, so we don't test all the way to the end of the test. Once they miss six in a row or hit the last item, that really helps us identify those. Um, early items on passage comp require a pointing to match a rebus with a drawing. So you just, which one's the house? So you use a rebus and you have that. Can you match that basically? The task requires pointing to a picture the words tell about. So what do these words tell about? And we want to see the child look at that and they don't have to read it. They just need to point to the picture that it reads to. We don't need to know, but can they just make enough sense to know that's yellow bird? Task requires reading the passage silently and providing a missing word. Easier items have pictures and shorter passages. So it starts off, something is in the wagon. It is a, so it gives them some picture clues like we do when kids are in that early development of reading. It starts off and then it gradually becomes more difficult like most scratches on an airplane window are caused by dirt and other particles in the air. When these particles become very, and then as you can see, um, the difficulty as the pictures are eliminated and passages are longer and they kind of trick them. They, they do a really nice job of, of tricking students if they're not really reading it where they can select a word that might fit, but it's, it's out of context of the, of the paragraph or the passage. Oops, I jumped ahead a little bit. So that's passage comp. Word attack, word attacks, excuse me. A measure of basic reading skills that contributes to two clusters. So basic reading skills, as we talked about, that's with letter word ID and phoneme graphing knowledge. There's a cluster that really helps you, especially for younger kids or elementary kids, where it can help you assess where that phoneme and grapheme knowledge is for them. If they're breaking down and we identify that phoneme grapheme, that might be an area that we want to investigate or possibly even intervene in based upon um, what we're getting. So again, we select a starting point based upon estimated achievement, basils and ceilings, test by complete pages. You start on the selected item, six lowest correct. So you start on 14. Again, if you go through, they get all those correct. That's your basal. You don't have to test 13 through one to go back. And then you test until they reach their ceiling of missing six 
incorrect and you want to test by complete pages. So if they, you don't want to stop the test in the middle of it. So if they missed the last four on a page, you turn it over, you want to complete testing by that complete page and then bracket that. That's what that means. That doesn't mean they need to miss 15 in a row or if they get one, you just need to test by complete pages. So they go through all of those. And by that point, a lot of times they're like, I don't know what that word is. I'm not sure. Um, so it, it appears to work out. Words must be read fluently to receive credit. Pronounced as a whole word on last attempt. Again, word attack, we'll go into what that is. It starts with early items. So we'll talk about what does this measure? Early items require pointing to the picture that starts with a specific sound. So point to the picture that starts with k, you know, so they point to cat, a, ah, or f as in fish. Point to the letter that makes a specific sound. So z or p. So they have to point to those letters when I make that sound. So we want them, do they understand that basic, right? And then read each of these to me, but don't go too fast. So, so if they're younger, you may want to point to them to help them really guide that and really um, correct them because some kids get... Um, they're trying to look for the real word, but you want them to understand tiff, zoop, then, wugs. Um, why, do you, why do you think word attack is an important test? I think sometimes this is, can be controversial I, and maybe it's not so much anymore, but does anybody want to um, unmute and take a guess at why word attack is important test to measure? I suppose it's, I suppose this is not really a form for this because we have to unmute you. If they so, cannot, uh, hello. Yeah, this, Christine, go ahead. If they cannot sound out, they, they are not reading. They are, they are guessing at the word by the pictures or they have memorized the word. Yep. If they cannot sound out the word, then they will never be strong readers. Yep. Very good. And using letter word ID, when kids become, they become very quick to pick up sight vocabulary. They have a strong sight vocabulary and that's what letter word ID does. But it's hard to know, can they really attack a word and utilize those skills to help identify unfamiliar words? And that's a difficult thing to measure. So we have to use words that are not real and say, just use those skills and see how they attack it because it's a combination of utilizing these skills to know where they're, if they have that, or are they just over relying on their sight vocabulary or another means to figure out words? If they, I just had a student who killed this test. I mean, they scored above the 50th percentile and couldn't do letter word ID, they were there. So that student over relies on their strong sound symbol relationship and they over rely on sounding everything out. Well, you and I know not every word, like a word like psychology, cannot be sounded out. It's something that we need to use some of that memory and context to understand. So reading is a blend of each of these. And we want to know how kids, that's why the test is built in these different tests, because we want to see overall, when we see a reading cluster low, we want to look to the subtest to see which subtest may be um, they're lacking in so we can um, understand where they're breaking down. Um, you do not want to pronounce any of the words or sounds for the subject, for the subject, for the student. Point to each items, really encourage them, really encourage them to use those. They're not real words, um, et cetera. And so, there was another comment yes. from Kathleen. And she said, to be sure the student is able to read the words. Sounding out words and being able to use the rules of letters is important for reading growth. Perfect. Yep. She said that better than I did. Thank you for that. Test eight, oral reading. A measure of oral reading skills that contribute to reading fluency. So this is a newer test. Um, again, this has been around, so it's maybe not new, but it's new for the Woodcock Johnson 4. Um, this is where they really bolstered up the reading component where they're having a lot more fluency measures. We know the importance of fluency over the last several years. Again, it's, it's, 
it's not everything, but it's part of the equation of reading, right? So we're identified just, can you, do you have sight vocabulary? Do you continue identify words and know them? Can you use your sound symbol as the uh, participants said and being able to decode words in that manner? And then can you take these skills of sight vocabulary and sounding it out? And can you do that in a fluent manner and see where that's all there? So that's an important, we didn't have this measure before. I would, when I was using the Woodcock Johnson three, I was supplementing the Woodcock Johnson with an oral reading measure because the Woodcock Johnson didn't have it. So it's nice that they included this to give me a measure of that oral reading because it may not be enough I may want to go and test it more with another test, but at least I have some idea where that reading, oral reading is. Um, starting point based upon the estimated achievement level, that's going to be the standard. Again, there's no hard or fast rule. You, it, you know, that's a judgment call. There's no wrong. I, I caution you. To, I knew someone who started at the beginning. I'll, I'll caution you on that. You don't want to over test a kid because they're going to get, they're going to fatigue quickly. And the ceiling is determined by cutoffs. So there's cutoffs on this one. Um, the scoring is based upon two, one, or zero. You get earned two points if sentences read with no errors. You get one point if the sentence is read with one error and zero if the sentence is read with two or more errors. So the type of reading errors that could occur, there's mispronunciation, pronounces the word incorrectly. They omit, they leave out a word, they insert Insertion, they add a word or words. Substitution, they say a word that is incorrect but maintain the sentence meaning. So house for home, they hesitate, does not pronounce the word within three seconds. If this happens, they go on to the next one. So we wanna know how fluently they're reading. Basic word ID, letter word ID, pardon me. We can allow a child to kind of figure it out. That's what that test does. This test is about oral reading. We have a measure, that's why sometimes you see letter word ID is high on, with students. It can be a higher standard score and these other reading scores may be lower because we allow the child time. We only take their last response. So they can be sounding out, figuring out a word and, go, and then kind of blending it themselves and then they say it and they get credit, but it may have taken them five seconds we can predict that they're not going to do as well on these oral reading measures because they're not fluent in their retrieval of these words, right? So this test, it really matters that they're doing it quickly because we want to know that they're able to get this because that's a big part of oral reading. We, and that's why it's important to differentiate that and administer these appropriately because it tells you where their breakdown is. Because if they have a reading, if, if they were identified with a reading problem and some of these tests are scoring in the average range, we wanna make sure we identify where those problem areas are. And that's what the Woodcock Johnson does. It takes a skill like reading and it separates it in eight different tests that identify what reading is. And if you can do all eight of these wells, you should be able to read. That's the theory. If you can only do three or four of them, it's gonna show up as a problem. And that's what we wanna do. So those are the other ones that you can score. Self-corrections within three seconds do not count as errors. So you can self-correct when they're going through there, but it's within three seconds. Very important, very important on this test that we pay attention to that three seconds, that hesitation. If it's not corrected, we've got to move on. Um, Starting with item one, I want you to listen to read aloud. Read as carefully as you can, not as fast as you can. If you, everything's in my way here. If you come to a word you cannot read, just do your best and then go on to the next word. You point to item one and you read the blue. Start here and read a, sto a story about bees. You mark error on the test record with a slash at the point of the sentence the error occurs. So if they insert or any of these. So if you go back, oops, let me go back. Um, give me a second here. So here's a story about bees. This is a, a, so a story they mispronounced about, they might've read it incorrectly, or they said a story, a boat, bees. So you can write what the error was and they mispronounced so you can put that in there. Oops, didn't mean to change that. Bees are little, they read it correctly, no problems. They earn two points. One point, they read they for there. They said there, that's a mispronunciation. Bees, K, 
can make, so they must have mispronounced can, make, and they might have read wax as honey. So they omitted can and they read honey for wax. They didn't even look at the word, they just guessed it. So they earned two because they had two mispronunciations. And five um, jobs, they, it looks like they hesitated for three seconds trying to figure it out. They may have read it correctly, doesn't matter. I always, I like to know that. So if they self-correct and I slash, I note that. I like to know that they're reading it right. It's just taking them longer and I counted it important. That's another qualitative interpretation that's important to know. If they can self-correct in time and they're just disfluent and they can't figure it out, that's important to know. And that's how it's scored. So for this section, one through five, they're in five points. So five or fewer points, you discontinue testing. Six or more points, you administer six through 10. So in this case, we would discontinue testing and we would be done with this. So I would assume this is probably a young child. If it's not, we would go to item six, um, six through 10 and we would administer those until we got to the scoring discontinue or this. So it has its own discontinue and continuation rules. So you continue until it tells you to stop. There's no basils and ceilings, okay? Follow continuation instructions to determine when to give additional items or when to discontinue testing. So um, again, we talked about that, five or less, six or more. It tells you what to do, you continue. Any questions on that, Gail? That's a newer test. I am not seeing any questions in the chat. If any of you have questions and you want to unmute and ask them, please feel free. Great. Okay, so moving on, we'll go to test number nine, sentence reading fluency. A test that's not new. It's one that's been around, so it's not anything that's new. So if you've given the Woodcock Johnson in various forms, this is something that is that has been around. You open the response booklet to the sentence reading fluency sample items and place directly from the student and you read the prompt. I want you to read some sentences and the answer is yes or no. You point to the amp and look at this sentence. It says the cow's an animal. Is that true? And hopefully the child says yes. You know, if they say no, then you, you give them the correction. There's a correction in this and you, you teach, there's a teaching of the item. That's what these sample items do. You teach the student how to administer it. They're the first couple are done, then they do it themselves. So once they are taught the item and they're able to complete it, you give the subject a pencil and say, now you look at the next four sentences, there's practice items draw a circle around the correct item, work as quickly as you can without making mistakes, go ahead. Follow the error and no response directions carefully to ensure the examinee understands the task. So if they get an error in what they do, read the sentence out loud and tell me the answer if yes or no. If the subject still gives an incorrect answer, explain the sentence and correct the answer. So show them, teach them how to do it. That's what you wanna do. If they have no response, read the sentence out loud and tell me if the answer is yes or no. And then if they can't read it, you have them try the next one. Um, if the examinee, here's the important part about the practice items. If the examinee has two or fewer correct on the practice exercise after error correction procedure, you record the score of zero for the test and you move on. We don't wanna give the child the test if they're not able to do it. And that's what the examinee does. So Gail, I see you have a question. I do, uh, Christine has a question. Can you tell the student that some of these sentences are silly, but not true, or is this too much information? Uh, you know, I have, when the kid notices that or we laugh about it, I do it in a more, um, when they acknowledge it, I guess I wouldn't provide that without them recognizing that. I've had students say, they'll look at me like, well, a fish can't fly. And I'll kind of laugh and say, yeah, so is that true? And they'll say, no, and I'm like, it's it exactly so. And so I do acknowledge when they pick that up that it's kind of silly, but I've, with all the students I've tested, um, I would say that's probably the, 
I wouldn't say that happens all the time. I think younger kids kind of get a kick out of it when they understand that and they find the humor in it. Older kids generally don't is what I found. But I think you can acknowledge that as long as it's not taking away or it's, um, I feel like that's building rapport with the student. What we don't want to do is um, contribute to lowering a test score or increasing a test score. We want to know what they have. We want to give the child the best possible opportunity to respond. So if you don't feel like that's crossing a barrier of helping or getting in the way or distracting, I would say, yeah, you can acknowledge that. But I would move on from that and, and utilize it as, yeah, that's why you answer no, that sort of thing. So good question. You want to record the exact finishing time in minutes and seconds. Early finishers, which I've never had. I don't know if anybody has. I'd be interested. Put in the chat if you've had someone who's finished the, all the reading in the full three minutes. I've never had that in my career. Um, but if you do, you want to put that exact finishing time because that gives them a higher score. Count the number of correct and incorrect. Don't count skipped items. Remind examinees to read silently, to cross out instead of erasing. We want them to be efficient and get through all three pages. When you see a kid stopping to erase, I just encourage them, we want to move quickly. You can just cross it out. We'll figure it out at the end. I want us, I want you to move quickly. Because you do tell them in the prompt that they're being timed. So it's not like we're not, we're not telling them that. Gail. Um, there's a comment from Jennifer. She says, personally, I feel that if it is not in the script for a test of this test, that it becomes fuzzy to say more as to the validity. I love that they have added some of these sentence reading pieces that, as you acknowledged earlier, pieces we would gain from supplemental testing. Yes, mm -hmm. I do. And I think that's a fair point when that's my point. There's building rapport and then there's taking the test and possibly contributing to how the scores are. That's why this is done in a standardized manner. You know, this is another training I do. I really talk about why tests are built this way. But just to go there for a second, it's because if Gail and I were administering this test to hypothetically the same student on the same day, the we should get the same results, right? Now, we know in test and measurement, there's error. A good day, a bad day, responsing, poor building. We don't want to be influential in them getting worse scores, right? If we can build good report and we don't want to give them enough hints or inf to give them a higher score where we give them more credit than what they deserve. We want to be detectives identifying where the problem is. And we just want to get true information so we can help our team determine it. That's why test and measurement and going through this in an accurate way is so important. However, I see people get so rigid that they're not building rapport and they don't get good results because they're not building that rapport. You, it's hard because I see, I, I went through these, but I also feel like there's time and a place to do that. You just have to be wise of when you're crossing that line because kids are savvy. I've had kids that have identified by my little nonverbals that they were getting answers right and getting answers wrong. I try to be as stoic as I can. So when I say good job, I just praise effort. I don't praise when they do something or, or when they guess and they really are courageous. And I'll re, re, I reinforce them when they guess something and they don't get it right or they get it wrong, just to encourage them to try. I'd say, I don't, this is not about right or wrong. This is about you really, I want to know what you know and what you don't know. And you're going to do hard items and you may not know them and that's okay. You know, just do your best. Um, Dan, I've got another question yep. from Leslie. Do you feel like it's better for a person who works often with the student to administer the test? I guess, as opposed to a relative stranger? That's, that, yes and no. Um, I'll use uh, colleagues I've had, it depends. It's one of those, it depends answers. For some students, I think having that rapport because of their personality and me coming in, I have gotten lower test scores on a student because I didn't have that and they were very self-conscious and I didn't pay enough attention to that. 
Then there were other times that the kid would just goof around for that person because they had a relationship with them. So it really depends on that student. And sometimes I think knowing the student's a benefit and sometimes it can be a hindrance. And it's knowing that child and really saying what's going to elicit the best the most accurate, not the best, the most accurate responses from this child so we can get a clear picture of them. Um, Thanks, great question. That, yeah, all good questions. Reading recall, this is a new test. So this is one I would like to, it's one we may have questions on because it's newer. This one is a reading skill that contributes to the reading comprehension. So this one's built to really expand. Reading comprehension is new because they're thinking about reading comprehension differently from the Woodcock Johnson three to the Woodcock Johnson four. The test has been there, but the cluster is rethought of what comprehension is in reading. So this is a test that contributes to that new thinking. Select the starting point again, estimated achievement level. This is another one that is determined, the ceiling is when you stop is determined by cutoffs. You score one or zero for each element. One if it's recalled correctly, zero if it's recalled, if it's not recalled or it's recalled incorrectly. So let's spend a little time on this one. So you tell the students, you want them to read some short stories. Please read each story silently one time. When you finish, I want you to tell it back to me. If you don't, you don't have to tell it back exactly, but try to remember all the things you can. So should they read, Anne lost her cat. She looked under, they're reading this to themselves, but then she saw it in a tree. The test, go ahead and read this to yourself. When you finished, look up at me. So you cue them when you're done. Turn the page after examining has read the story one time. So you turn the page and you say to them, tell me everything you remember about the story you remember. Um, Anne lost her cat, looked under the car, and then she saw it in a tree. Oh, this thing. Place a check mark over each element the examiner recalls correctly. The order does not matter. So they don't have to recall it in sequence. And you'll notice when it gets more complex, they'll go through the basic things and then they'll start adding details. I've noticed that with Childs. This story has five elements. The bold words are the keys to receiving credit for the elements. So they need to. So when she has that, when they read that, the key element is they need to know the person's name, Anne. They need to know that there's something about a cat that, you know, that at some point she looked under the car and she saw it. And where did they see it? In a tree. So you want those elements have to be there to create, to get credit. So here's an example response using that prompt. Her cat was lost and she found it in a tree. So the examinee earns two points for this response. One, she didn't get credit for Anne. I think we might have that. So cat, tree. She didn't have anything about Anne. She didn't have under the car. And then she saw it. Makes sense. If not, let me know. Pretty basic test to have that recall. Recall is important because you want them to be understood. Are they self-monitoring and understanding what they're reading, right? So we're getting into comprehension and we want to understand that they're reading the words. They seem to have good letter word ID, but they're not understanding anything and they do poorly on that test. You know, what is that telling us about this student? They're doing well on everything else, but they're not short-term memory? What do we want to look into to maybe understand that a little bit better? Test 15, a supplemental test. Um, a measure of the reading skill that contributes to reading rate cluster. So there's a new reading rate. Um, administer sample items and practice exercise to all examinees. It's a time test, so it's three minutes to complete. You use scoring one or zero. Um, and there's a guide overlay that you can use to have that. Do not tell the examinee any words on the test. Yes, Gail, before I continue. Um, there's a question from Janice. Is it okay for a student to read aloud? I've had students say they want to read aloud, 
because it helps them remember more. Yeah, I, it is. And I've had that. And um, as long as they're reading it, you know, I just encourage them, but if they're going to be doing that uh, and I would take note of it, I would just say, you know, you can just read it. And if you prompt that and they continue to do that, I don't know if I would let that, I wouldn't even let that be a hang up. Um, I would note it. Here's another qualitative observation that I would bring to the team. I would want to be curious to why that is. That's, you know, they're not being able to sub vocally read. So they're trying, I mean, I guess, if this was a little bit more interactive and if I was in the crowd and this was a little bit more fluid, I would be asking you and I don't want you to, or maybe put in the chat for Gail. What would you, if they were doing that, what would you, what could you hypothesize? Why would they be doing that? What would you be thinking about? What would you want to know more about? To me, it's not about right or wrong in the administration, even if they're doing it, it's about why are they doing it that way? And I want to let the child guide that and not influence that. But some way I'd be thinking about, you know, and Gail, maybe you can, as people are chatting in there, you can see what people think about why they would be maybe doing that. What would you be thinking about? Any, are there any comments in there? I haven't yet? seen a comment yet. Uh, so we have a lot of slides, so I don't want to give too much wait time on this. And it's okay because I'd be worried that they have to hear it out loud. So they're not sub vocally. They're not being able to monitor when they're reading sub vocally, because that's what we do. Right. And then we start taking liberties, right? We don't read everything completely. You're not reading the, it, you're kind of glancing over it and you're getting the gist of it and hitting critical words. Think of how fluently you can read when you're reading silently. That's what we want kids to do, but not too quickly where they're losing track of what they're saying. So that's something we would really want to think about and think about oral language. Why, why are they unable to do that? And I would want to know about their, their language abilities, short-term memory, and other things that might be helpful for us. So I would ask the psychologist, hey, how's their working memory? How is this? What do you make of this? Are there other test scores that are, that are suggesting a same, similar pattern of, of a task that's manifested differently? Great. Word reading fluency. Um, reading rate cluster, I think I already have three minutes. Oh yeah, we did this part. So word reading fluency, I want you to read some words and then decide which two words go together. So um, I want you to read some words, which words go together. If the words were apple tree, moon, and banana, you would draw a line through apple and banana because they're both fruit. If the words were pair, drum, and coach, and chair, you would draw a line through couch and chair because they're both furniture. This is a much more complex task. So point to the sample item A. Then you say, look at these words. They say pen, red, fox, and pencil. Because you can use pen, and you can use a pen and a pencil to write, you would draw a line through both pen and a pencil. You point to the lines through pen and pencil. Now you move on to B. Now look at these words. They are ham, blue, green, and toe. Because blue and green are both colors, you would draw a line through them. Give the subject a pencil with an eraser and say, go ahead. Then you have them do that. Then you move on to the practice exercise. See, the big thing with some of these more complex, you're teaching them how to do the task as you're going through. Now look at these, and this is where you can ask, they can ask questions about it. This is the time when we're talking about it that you can have a little bit of discussion. Okay, so if they have some questions, yeah, you can answer it. But once you're in the testing, then you, you, that needs to be done. This is where you wanna clarify, that's why you're doing this. Now look at these next four rows of words. Draw a line through the two words that go together in each row. Work as quickly as you can without making mistakes. Go ahead. So they go through it. Shoe sock, red, green, red, great. They did a good job. You wanna follow the error, no response directions carefully to ensure the examinee understands. So this is when you're coaching and you're mentoring them on how to do this task. If they have errors, read the words aloud and tell me the two words that go together. Um, then if the subject still gives incorrect answers, explain the two words and correct answer. So you give them that so they know. If no response, read the words aloud and tell me the two words together. 
and then just point to try the next one. If the examinee has one or zero correct on practice exercise, discontinue testing and rescore, record a score of zero. You don't give the test to have them get zeros. If they can't get through that, you go through the practice items, you go through all of this. This is, these are sections through the test. Um, I'm gonna stop. So we have a couple tests where they have these, when you're coaching them, when you're looking at the manual and you're ready to give this and you want to, I would become familiar with the manual and the word reading fluency administration. So I would go into the technical manual and really read through that because they go in greater detail about this, of what you can and cannot do. I don't know this off the top of my head, but before I go in, I always remind myself of what that is, or I have that manual available, which I was going to be a good presenter and have my manual here. It's out in my car. I forgot to bring it in this morning in case you guys had real specific questions. The technical manual covers it. Um, so you want to really understand some of these more nuanced practice items. So you're administering it correctly and applying it well. You don't have to go through and review letter word ID. It's a pretty basic test to give. But word reading fluency and some of this error and no response and if they're not getting it, what do you do? It would be worth your time to just become more familiar and practice it a few times and ask questions. Record exact finishing time in minutes and seconds. Early finishers who do well receive higher score than individuals who work for the full three minutes. Count the number correct. You do not count skipped items. Remind the examinee to read silently, cross out instead of erasing, and do all three pages. Test 17, um, reading vocabulary, a measure of reading that it contributes to the reading comprehension extended cluster. Um, you do both subtests. There's two subtests, it's synonyms and antonyms, it's 17A and B, but both of those tests have basils and ceilings on its own. And then, so there's, but it, it's combined to make one subtest score. So it's one test, with two subtests kind of intertwined in it. You administer sample items to all the examinees and then choose the appropriate starting point. So you give samples, you go to the starting point. Basils and ceilings, these change. It used to be on the Woodcock Johnson 3, if I remember correctly, it's been a while, that ceilings and basils were always six. So we have to watch because they've changed this where some of them, there's basils and ceilings of five. They've changed some of the basils and ceilings. Um, so five lowest correct or item one. If you're starting because they're a high schooler and they start on item 10, if they get the first five correct, they hit their basils. You don't have to give anything below where you started. And then you test until you get the highest incorrect. This is not by complete pages. It's just when they get to the highest incorrect. Boop. Or you reach the last item. You do not read any words to the examinee during this test. Only one word responses are acceptable. If a two word response is given, you ask for just one word. Accept correct responses that differ in a number or tense. So you can vary that and do not accept responses that are a different part of speech. So let's look at some of the samples. Point to street on the subject's page and you say, another word that means street is road. Point to large on the subject's page, and then you say, tell me another word for large. And it gives you correct and incorrect items, big, gigantic, enormous. This is not an exhaustive list. So you may have to write it down and go check after the test and give more items if you're uncertain, if it's not there. But if it's not in either part and you think it might be close, I would go look it up and maybe make some... Um, um, judgment there or, or, or ask someone what they think. Score item, if there's an error or no response, you score item zero and say another word for large is big. You repeat sample A and you want them, you cueing them to say that so they get it on the right track. Then on, so that's synonyms. So you go through the same and then on antonyms, when you get to that test, so you administer the synonyms, now you're in the antonyms. Now we are gonna do um, something different. The opposite of night is day. You point to the subject and say, tell me the opposite of no. And if they say yes, 
it's pretty easy. There's not much more for no. You know, it's it's yes, there's one answer for this one. It's pretty easy. And then there's the error and response if they um, get it incorrect. So now to close up, those are all the subtests that make the reading. So let's talk about these larger skit. So reading, and you can see um, this is the, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on what that's called the uh, factor analysis where they have that. So this different factor analysis that they use that they group in these factor for reading, you know, it's a global reading score. So this is a global reading that you can use for factor analysis interpretation, the corn hotel, the CHC theory, if some of you know that, I don't want to talk about that. That's pretty complex, but this is based upon some of those theories. The cognitive oral language is based upon CHC theory. That's a discussion for a whole nother day. There's some work that people have done with that, but that's what those, these little codes are, is that CHC theory. Corn Hotel, Corn, uh, Cattell Horn, someone needs to help me with that, it's been a while. So the two cluster of reading achievement, including decoding, comprehension, and reading and writing, test one and test four, give you that, it shows you the reliability. So it's a really reliable test um, for kids and adult. Broad reading is a three cluster that makes up fluency in all of these. These are the subtests that make it up. It's got strong reliability in what it measures. Basic reading skills makes up letter word ID, word attack. Again, you can look at the reliability. Um, reading comprehension, so two cluster reading comprehension reasoning and to a lesser extent, long-term retrieval. So it weighs on some of these other skills. It has passage comp, reading recall. You can look at the median reliability. Um, reading comprehension extends, extended adds a third test. Um, so you can have extended reading comprehension. You can have a two test or you can have a three test utilizing that. Um, reading fluency. Um, it has the, the general reading and writing. It also weighs on cognitive processing. So reading fluency weighs on processing speed. It actually clues you into that you need to have some good processing speed to do these tests. So if we see a processing speed on the Weschler or some other psychological tests low, and we see this low, that's telling us that there's a psychological error that they struggle with that might influence their reading and how you intervene. That's how you connect those um, two together. Reading rate. Um, again, breaks it up. That's test nine, sentence reading fluency and word reading fluency. Again, it has that general reading and writing, and it weighs on some processing speed. Because some of these academic tasks weigh on other cognitive processes, right? That's what we say a learning disability is. We see a lot of kids with learning disabilities who have processing speed deficits. So naturally, some of these tasks require you to have good processing speed ability that you need to have that as a subset of that cognitive ability to do this task. So if that cognitive ability is impaired or not well developed or whatever's going on, that can influence these academic tasks because it weighs on that cognitive structure in this test. So in summary, the reading subtests are eight tests for evaluating different aspects of the reading, um, passage comp, some new tests, Provide seven clusters for a comprehensive evaluation of the reading performance. We've gone through all that. A really good test. So what do we do when we see, what do I do now when I get these tests and I see the intra-cluster considerations for basic reading skills? So I have some variation in there. What can I think about with that? So there's some instructional mod modifications, match materials to reading level, provide reading materials that match interests, use other medias, decrease oral reading and demands, shorten assignments, you know, and then these are some instructional strategies that can be thought about. There's more, oops, I didn't mean to change that. Again, you're gonna have all of these, um, some strategies match appro approach to student, focus on reading for meeting, whole word, um, phonics method. A lot of things you can do when you see that these, some considerations when you see some of these clusters in that. Um, what about 
when you have for reading comprehension? What are some modifications when you're noticing that? Again, some um, instructional levels, alter assignments, some strategies, um, semantic feature analysis, semantic maps, closed procedures, story maps, direct strategies, direct reading, self-question, reciprocal teaching, um, that you can use a lot of different approaches. Reading fluency. So modification, you can think about books on tape. If they can't have that, can you assist in that? Use extra time, option to work in a quiet place. Um, some strategies for fluency. You can do repeated reading, some speed drills, choral reading, increased time. And again, I think there's a lot of other interventions that are out there that would just lead you how you can match some of those deficits when you're seeing that in other areas aren't deficit. These are some things that you would want to think about if you saw that reading fluency lower than the other domains. Any questions on reading? Gail, would this be a good time to take five, 10 minutes as a break? I think so. Um, why don't we take a 10 minute, oh, wait, we got a question before okay. we do that. And then I think we'll take a 10 minute break just to stretch or whatever you need to do. The question is, this is from Juanita. Going back to word attack, if a student scores low, is there an intervention for that? Um. Is there, yeah, I think we would want to find out if word attack is low, what I would say, are there interventions for that? Yeah, there are. I would wanna know why. I would wanna maybe dabble in to know why that is. That's where that qualitative analysis, and I don't know how in depth we're gonna to get to that. That's more into that advanced interpretation, but I wanna get, I'll, I'm gonna at least address that in the last few minutes. Because that's where that qualitative versus quantitative. So she's saying quantitatively, if word attack is low, you know, like, what do I do? Some of that's going to be guided on what you saw in the other tests, how they performed. You might want to give a test. So we know about word attack. It's their sound sibyl. If they weren't able to figure out the words or they had no clue, I would be talking to the speech path or other people or a teacher, if I'm not their teacher, saying, how's their phonics? How's their, can they rhyme? I may want to give a test that's very comprehensive test of phonological processing. I would possibly give the CTOP. I think a lot of you who are in SPED and experience, I've seen some of your names, I know. I would maybe give a test that told me more about that. Word attack alone doesn't give us enough information to maybe go and do something. I would maybe want to know more about that because word attack is important. So I would want to know, do the, can they identify sounds? Do they know, do they have their letters and sounds? Where's the breakdown? Can they put them together? So they know their letters and sounds. Can they blend them together? Are they not able to segment or blend words? There's a lot of things that could be going wrong. And then once I know why they're not able to perform that task, I would intervene. But I could generally say that a word attack problem, if they really struggle with that, that's really, they don't have a good sound symbol relationship. And we've got to go back. Can they rhyme? Can they, do they know the sounds and symbols that correlate? Can they put those sounds and symbols together and make, you know, utterances? Can they put things together? And do they know the knowledge and the rules of some of these sounds when they're put together to sound a word out like that, V-A-T? and do that. And I would intervene. Most likely they struggle with some aspect of that, phonemic awareness, phonics, and that's where the intervention would come in, would be that. But I would wanna know a lot more before I would venture a guess. Does that answer that? Did I? Juanita? If not, push me for more. Um, she says, no, nope. she said, yes, thanks. All right. So now that we completed the reading portion, I, a little bit of an editorial here from me, you can see that we have, the Woodcock Johnson has eight subtests. And um, I think we can all agree on here, reading is really important. And um, reading has been more researched than a lot of the other areas of um, knowledge. 
And so it seems like our knowledge is a little bit better. Math is, I think, to me, it lags a little bit behind on what we know about reading. And I think we all can agree why that probably has been. Reading is a, a very important task to be successful, especially in education and going into college. It's, it's just a necessary skill. So math is not as robust. And um, I'd like to see tests, and I think they're probably going to get there to get a little bit more nuanced about helping us understand. But when we get into the math part of it, we have four tests. I'm going to go over this part pretty quickly because some of these are really basic. It's kids doing math because I really want to get to the end of it. But I want to stop and I want to talk a little bit more in detail about the written language. But math is important. We just don't have as many tests. I think a lot of it is just having kids do math problems. And, um, but we can talk a little bit more about what some of that may mean. So math provides four clusters to evaluate performance. We have four tests. We have mathematics, that general math. So you can give the first six tests and you can get a general reading score, math score, and a writing score, you know, and we'll talk about that for the writing. There's a broad math and we'll talk about each of those math calc, math problem solving. Again, when we're determining eligibility, math calculation, math problem solving, really correlate well with math calculation skills disability and math problem solving or math reasoning for identification. And that's the clusters and math. Broad math is an encompassing of all of those of skills and problem solving in a broad view score. So that's the difference between those. Mathematics is brief. Broad is looking at skills and the the, the knowledge, and then you can look at just skills and just the, the knowledge of understanding math and relationships. Um, <clears throat> so test two, applied problems. This is not a new test. This is a test that's been there. Um, it, uh, it responds to all six clusters that we have for math. Um, start points based on examinees estimated achievement level. We've talked about that. <coughs> um, and um, this is someone asked me, is it good for someone to know the student when they're doing it? Or what's my view of that? This is where it's really good to know the student and know where they're at. So we can start them appropriately where they're at. Because again, the key to this is getting the best response from student, not the best response, to get what they actually know in this. We want to really understand what they know in these areas. Um, basils and ceilings, test by complete pages, complete them. Five lowest, again, the basal here, it's not six, it's five. So be careful. The protocol really lines out all these decision rules well. If you give the Woodcock Johnson, they really have, have a nice test that really, you can get all the information you need is right at your hand on those pages about basils and ceilings and all of that. Um, very few of them need more investigation in the technical manual. And that's one really nice thing. The Woodcock Johnson is well done for ease of administration by people who may not have a lot of it. Some other tests are a lot more complicated to give. And that's one thing I have to give the authors of this is that's, it's, it's really, it's, 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 a, it's a really well done test. Um, but anyways, applied problems. You read all the items to, the, to all examinees, repeat any items upon request, provide the worksheet in the response booklet and a pencil at 25, item 25 or earlier, if the examinee requests or appears to need a paper and pencil. So they can work out these problems on a scratch sheet. You wanna keep it so you can see how they're working um, and complete all queries, which mean um, if they're asking more information. So the queries is like, um, well, we'll go into that where they have that. That's like if, if you need to question more of what they're doing. So. Like they may, they may have five, it might be five cents is the response and they only put five in their response and you have to five what? And they have to say five cents to get the answer correctly. But we'll, I think we'll address that a little bit later. And that's what they mean by queries. Um, unit labels are not required unless specific in the key. Um, while working in an art project, um, then she cuts each peach in half again. How many pieces of paper does she have? Four. There's no label required. Um, so here's another example of the sense this, there's a label required on this. It's 50 is 50 is not. So you want to query that. So complete all queries. That's what they mean. If a unit label is specified, both the label and numeric answer must be correct to receive credit. So if any questions on that, it has to both be there. 
Anytime an incorrect unit is label is given, whether required or not, score the answer as incorrect, even if the numeric portion was correct. Listen, if you had $10 and you spent five of them, how many dollars would you have? Five. Example responses, five cents, that's a zero. Five, one. Five dollars is one. So five, I can't even think of another example that would be um, rubles if they were from another, you know, that would not be correct. It's got to be five or five dollars. There are five children here. There are five balloons. How many children do not have balloons? The correct answer is two. This is how you score these examples. Two, two balloons, two children. So two is correct. Two balloons is not two children because they weren't asking about the balloons. There's qualitative observation because this is one of the first tests. Again, we talked about using that data to compare examinees' performance to their age mates. It just aids in that interpretation. Um, it helps. We really want people to start thinking more qualitatively, not just quantitatively. And so this is their attempt at getting you to think about what, how did they do this? Um, so here's the four questions you need to answer. You only mark one. Um, and then it gives, like we said, I call it base rates, but a percentage of how kids did on that. And we talked about that in the reading, but it gives you that measure to say, how did kids do? Did a lot of kids do it as well as this child? It's just another way to help you interpret. Calculation. Um, contributes to five of the clusters. You start on the estimated achievement. It, the basils and ceilings are six highest. No, not by complete pages because it's, it's a booklet and they're doing math problems. Except poorly formed or reverse numerals as correct, but transpose numbers as incorrect. So 21 for 12 is incorrect. But if they reverse a five, you can count it. We are not testing their letter formations. If you know it's a five and it's distinguishable, count it as correct. If it's, if it's not clear, then you may want to count it incorrect and you may want to get someone else's in, interpretation of it. Um, do not read items or you can ask them, what number is that? And if they give you the right one, again, we want to know because if they know the answer and they can't write it, that tells us there's a different problem. If they know how to do stuff and they've got their numbers all goofed up or they have reversals, that's, I'm not going to give them a math intervention. I'm going to give them a different intervention. Or I may want to have them have an occupational, you know, to look at their visual spatial or their visual perception. It might be a visual perception problem. Do not read items or assist examinee in any way. Complete the, all the queries. So, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, when they're doing this, they have a booklet and they're doing, they're adding fractions. The correct answer is one half. If they would do this, they could have two fourths. You need to ask them to simplify that answer and do not explain further. If they don't know or they just kind of look at you and move on, that's fine. You just you simplify your answer. Test 10, math facts fluency. A measure of basic math skill that contributes to four clusters. These are not new, start at item one and it's a time test for three minutes. Do not point out signs during the test. In your instructions, you say that watch the signs, it's part of the queuing, but you don't say anything. That is something that is a executive function task. That's important to math. Math is a big working memory executive function task. There's a lot of steps, there's a lot of sequences. First you do this, then you do this, and all of that. And that's important to know, because if they know their basic facts and they're able to do it, but <clears throat> they don't know how the sequence of it, or how to um, shift their thinking, that's probably where we want to intervene, not in the math. Um, and remind examinee to cross out instead of erasing, skip problems they cannot solve and do both pages. The idea in that is to get them to move quickly. If they're slowing down and erasing, we want them to respond. We don't want to see that they're erasing. Gail, go ahead. Okay, so Leslie has a question. This refers to middle school. If the student has a different special education teacher for ELA and math, would it be better to have those respective teachers administer their portion of the test? Not necessarily. Again, that's why the test is set up standardized is because 
in theory, we should be able to, the goal is, is why we follow the blue writing, why I'm reading that and doing the queuing and kind of modeling that. This training, I could actually have you practice some items, I, but we don't have time for that. Um, but what that means is if you get good enough of it, like I said at the beginning, Gail and I should be able to administer this to the same student and elicit the same standard scores and responses from them. That's the goal. The goal is not about the kid. The goal is about being able to administer this to any kid and any of you teachers be getting similar results. If it's, there are some kids though that are tough, tough. And you may, you know your students and sometimes you wanna do that. Changing the tester in midstream of the test, I would not advise because you want that to be done by the same evaluator the whole time because you might be just a little bit different. In theory, you should keep that. But I would say if someone's giving it, regardless of who's giving the writing, the math or the reading, one person should administer the test for the fluidity of that test. Okay. Um, I don't think you need to differentiate to that. Another question. Um, during this time of social distancing, six foot distancing, the student is working six feet away and I'm unable to see their writing. Is it okay to go back and ask the student to simplify after the test is completed? Yes, I think so. Yes, I believe that would be okay. I will actually check in with them because I have had some kids that just continue to do math problems and they're just, they've been way off. And so they're doing items way beyond it. And I just stop them. I'll check in and I'll just say, hey, can you simplify this one? Slide your book over, slide it across the table. Let me check how you're doing. And then I cue them. I've done that in the middle of the test um, just to make sure that they're not doing items that are so above and I'm wasting their time or my time because they've already sealinged out and there's no sense in moving on when they're already done. And I just tell them, that's what I needed. Thank you, you're done. You know, and I'm done, but simplify this one or whatever that queuing is. I, that is appropriate. Okay, thanks, Dan. The last thing in math facts fluency, just to remind, again, it's about speed. We want to really encourage them to keep going, encourage them to cross it out. We'll figure it out. You want to see how many they can do. Um, not that they can erase neatly. Here's the math facts fluency. Use a scoring guide overlay. There's an overlay. Each row has 10 items, so you can go through quickly. If they miss two, the total's eight out of 10. Um, and so it's pretty, it makes it pretty easy to score. As you can see here, see how they, they swatch the signs. You gotta really watch that, that's important. You see kids, they do really good right away. And then they start adding everything. That's important qualitative information to bring to the team. There's many, I always tell people when we're talking about this, there's a lot of reasons why kids may not perform as well on this. Very few percentage come to be a disability. There's a lot of factors that we need to consider. And we're gonna talk about that more towards the end about these other factors we need to consider in this, these qualitative factors that can help it. Again, when we start, when I say, it's not just a test score. We're not just trying to get test scores. Those test scores are helpful for the identification, to standardize it, to, it, 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 it's a tool, but it's not everything. And we, we over rely on those numbers. We got to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And that's where the qualitative piece comes in that we don't talk about. We want to understand why they got it wrong. Why do they have a standard score of 78 on math backs fluency? That's at the sixth percentile. That's pretty low. How many items did they complete? Did they complete them wrong? Did they miss the signs? Do they just not know how to add and subtract? Do they just work slow? Is it processing speed? There's a lot of variables that come into why it is. And it may not have to do with the math disability per se. It could be something else. Test 13, number matrices, <clears throat> not a new test, but it's new on the academic. Um, it's a measure of math reasoning that contributes to the math problem solving cluster. So it only measures in the math problem solving. You select appropriate starting point with knowledge, it has basils and ceilings, test by complete pages. They have these items on there. They don't want you to start, start and stop in the middle of a page. They want you to test by, through the whole page to get these items and then do your basils and ceilings when you're done by the, the complete pages, when you calculate your raw score. 
provide the worksheet and response booklet and pencil when directed. Number matrices was in um, the Wilcock Johnson um, in another test for, uh, I think it's the, in more of a quantitative concept type of a thing in more math, but now they moved it to the academic because it weighs so much on the quantitative component of it. So they moved it to academic. Um, to be correct, number must solve the puzzle vertically and horizontally. So you start here for K to grade six, Sample B, start here for grade seven to adult. Um, I just got to move faces here. Monitor response time, items one through 11 have 30 second guidelines, so they've got to respond. We know kids given five minutes on each of these probably slowly can figure things out, but there's some automaticity that we want to know. Can they see these and come up with this? So there's some time guidelines um, because enough time can get the answers, but sometimes there's efficiency. We want people to see those patterns and those that are there. Items 12 and higher have a one minute guideline. So be mindful of those time guidelines and set a watch and just kind of keep an eye on it or a clock. And I just run the timer and I just match the time to make sure. Because a lot of times people, not a lot of students, once they get to 30 seconds, a lot of times they give up, but you have some that really try hard to figure it out and we want to move them. Um, on. If a subject does not appear actively engaged in its solving problem, we encourage it. If subject still does not respond, score item zero and keep them going. Try this one. Um, do not give an answer, just keep them going. Um, responds to shaded boxes. If a subject provides numbers for shaded boxes two and 10, say, just tell me the number that belongs in the empty box. So if they figure that out, that there's two and there's a 10, we want to know that answer. That's the answer that we want. If an examinee provides a response that is not a whole number, ask them to, them to solve the problem using the whole number only. If they're confused by more than one matrix per page, you may uncover one at a time, use hand or a paper. You can put paper there just to have that there if they're getting confused. A few matrices have more than one possible answer listed in the correct key. Only one correct answer is required to receive credit. So some of them are complex enough that there's a couple answers that could be correct. As long as they get one of them, they don't need to have both of them. They're correct. Interpretation, again, the mathematics. We talked about the CHC theory, um, quantitative knowledge. All right, that's what GQ means. That's the two cluster math achievement measures quantitative knowledge. That's GQ, including problem solving and computational skills, applied problems, calculation, good reliability on the measure, broad math. Again, it has that quantitative component, but a, a number facility, automaticity and cognitive processing speed. So the three cluster includes problem solving, computational skills, number facility, automaticity and cognitive processing. It's important to know what those things on this broad math. So when broad math is low, you can say which one of these um, problem solving computational skills is low that's causing their score to be low, unless it's all of them. Math calculation skills, two cluster. Again, a lot of processing speed. You see this processing speed comes up often in these academic skills. That's why we measure it as psychologists because it's, it's helpful. That's where it's helpful. There's a lot of processing speed um, in academic tasks. Um, so that's what math calculation skills, good reliability, uh, math problem solving. Um, you get a new cluster, you get another, the fluid reasoning, um, being able to take, fluid reasoning is um, being able to take novel tasks and solve it. So if I say, here's a puzzle and it's, it has something, I need you to solve this right now. You've never been exposed to it. So you've got to use your reasoning. You're not, you may take what you know and try to apply it, but you have to kind of come up with problem solving there. And that's what these do. It's really this fluid. Okay, what do I know? But what, what, what do they have to go back and know their knowledge of? Math to solve these problems. These are simple problems. A lot of times that apply problems in number matrices, but you have to have math concepts to do them. That's the key. Um, and can they apply it? They may know their math, but do they know when you're asking what math formula to use, 
when you're asking them the question. So there are some interpretation that you can do of where they're breaking down through that, um, through that problem. Math summary, there's four tests measuring various aspects of it. We went through those four quickly, uh, provides four clusters for comprehensive evaluation. So it creates different clusters that can help aid in interpretation to use that for identification. There's a lot of different reasons going to those different clusters. So what do I do um, if math skills is low? So you here's some instructional modifications that you have in those, some strategies we can think about, um, some real general ideas for that. Um, math reasoning, again, some of these are real, they're pretty basic, um, they're similar. You can modify a level of difficulty reduce number of problems, rewrite word problems, um, alter sequence. Um, so instructional strategies require conceptual understanding, go from concrete to abstract, provide story problem activities, focus on life skill, mathematics when necessary. All right, written language. Any questions, Gail, on math? We can jump ahead if they come in. We can stop and go back, but I'm going to continue because of time. Um, I really want to get to the, the last part of this. So written language. Um, there are some tests that are take a little bit more nuance to, to administer that I want to go through on this one. Uh, math is pretty um, basic um, because it's giving math and doing math problems there. So there's five tests for written language, um, in various aspects. So you have, you have them spell, you do writing samples, they do some writing, they do writing fluency, there's editing subtests and spelling of sound subtests that make up the written language. And we'll go through each of those. It provides four clusters to evaluate performance in the written language domain. So they combine these subtests to give you a written language domain, a broad written language domain, basic writing skills in a written expression domain. We've talked about the importance of that, the use of that for identification. It helps you cluster all these skills to help you interpret what part of the written language may be a little bit lower. Is it written expression, basic writing skills? There's a level of analysis that can go through um, that at some point, maybe we can go through that. Um, so let's talk about each test that makes these up. Spelling, pretty basic. It's a measure of spelling that can contributes to six of the clusters. Spelling's a big test. You know, when they contribute to, I always say when they contribute to all of the clusters, a lot of the clusters, yeah, it's a pretty big test. So spelling's a big test, right? It tells us a lot. Um, you select appropriate starting point, basal ceilings, um, and know the correct pronunciation for all items. Make sure you know when you're reading the words that you know how to, we, you know how to pronounce them so you're saying it correctly. Um, so this is not by complete pages, you read them. Once they hit their six highest, you're done because they're writing it, you're reading it. So let's go through, uh, whoops, let's go through an example of that. You can accept upper or lower case unless it's um, specified, accept reverse letters as correct unless they form different letters. Reverse B becomes a D, so this is incorrect. Reverse C does not become a different letter, so it's acceptable. Printing is requested, but cursive is acceptable. Other items administered as a dictated spelling test. So, did I miss something there? So, other items administered as a dictated spelling test. Um, Qualitative observation. So this just really looks at pencil grass, some real basic things for pre-writing things, pencil grip and stuff like that. They do some basic letters and then you ask them to spell words. That's the rest of it. That's really what it comes down to. Use data to compare examinees performance to age mates. This also has qualitative observations. You mark one of these four boxes. They compare it to the, the normative sample that they have. How did other five-year-olds, how did other six-year-olds, how did other fourth graders do compared to their peers? To help you understand, was their performance better, worse? 
compared to their standard scores. It's just, again, a lot of numbers to help you make sense of what you're seeing with this student. Writing samples um, is the next test. It's a measure of written expression that contributes to five of the clusters. Select appropriate block of items to administer based on examinee's estimated achievement level. I think this can be tough. I think this is the hardest one to guesstimate because this is the task I think kids most often don't want to do because they, a lot of times students who struggle academically appear to sometimes struggle with the written task. I have a lot of kids who just, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do writing and all of this. Um, so getting that block of items is right because if you, if, you, if you start too easy, then you have to give 18 instead of 12 items. If you start too hard, then you have to, you start them off at a frustrational level and you have to go back and give them easy items. So you, you do your best and you know you get, you get good at guesstimating where they're at. So you select your appropriate block of items to administer um, based upon what you know of their estimated achievement level. Hopefully by this time in the test, you have an idea of how they're gonna do so it can help you. And then you consult the adjusted item block chart in the test record form if the score falls in a shaded area to determine if you need to do additional items should be administered. Items one through six are scored one or zero. So pretty basic, that's for very young kids. The items seven and higher through the rest are scored two, one or zero. You can score items half or one, one and a half. And a lot of people don't know that. If it's really between a two or a one and you can't decide, score to one and a half. Um, it's suggested you do that. And then you calculate it and then you do rounding um, for that. Um, use the scoring because a half point between 10 and 11 isn't going to make that big of a difference between a standard score in the average range or, but if they miss that point, they're going to be well below average. That just isn't going to happen. You're going to get them in the general area. And there's standard error of measurement. There's an error, right? Um, so that's why you can do that. And we would do half points and a couple half points. If you have a child, you know, you have a two, two, a one, a 1 1.5, a 0.5, you know, zero or whatever like that. Those two half points will even them out and give you a whole number. So sometimes it just evens itself out. They have a really comprehensive scoring guide in the examiner's manual to score this test. When you're doing this, I would have that open. I still open that up um, to use to guide me in interpreting it. It's until you get really good about it. <clears throat> but I still have that available when I'm scoring it. Do not spell any words for the examinee. You may read any printed word in any item, in an item to the examinee upon request. So if there's items provided, if you've given the test, you would know that that's, you can give those to them. So here's an example of written, let's talk about writing samples here. So you open the response booklet to writing samples. You give the subject a pencil and you say, I'm gonna ask you to do some writing. Please write or print your answers neatly so that I can read them. It tells you, you know this, you can tell the subject any printed words, we said that, repeat instructions if needed. <clears throat> if the subject asks about spelling, you just say, just do the best you can. So the booklet will tell you a lot of times what to say. So if kids are asking a lot of questions, you say, just do the best you can, just put it down there. So number one, point to the item. This says, my name is, point to the blank and say, write your name here. Number two, point to the words and say, this is A. Point to the blank and say, write the words here that finishes this sentence. Standard score response is one, meet task requirements, score inadequate or an eligible response is a zero. Pretty easy for one through six. I just gotta move my, this part. One point must have at least one initial letter, first or last name, and one or more correct letter. Reverse is okay, upper or lowercase, okay. So one point must begin with the k sound, C or K, and include the letter R. Reversals are okay. So that scores one point, having that. So really look at the scoring instructions because again, when a child's developmentally maybe not there and they know elements of it, they get credit for that. So the scoring on those early items are pretty basic 
because we know a five or six year old may not have that, but are they beginning to be able to put those sounds and sequences together and understand how to put that there? That's for very young, young students who you want to get a, a, an idea. If it's not allowed, they'll tell you um, that you need to have it in complete sense. The upper items, you cannot have um, appropriate, uh, that's the wrong word. You, you, you can't, you know, only specified in those items that they will allow something that's not actually correct. We don't hit kids on spelling on this because we, we measure spelling on another test. So you may need to have kids <clears throat> read the sentences and transcribe it so you know what they're saying. So when you're starting with item seven for older kids, you start by saying, I'm gonna ask you to do some writing, please write or print your answers neatly so that I can read them. If they are asking, hey, what about this or that? You just say, just do the best you can. So number seven, as an example, you say number seven, write a good sentence that tells what is happening in this picture. Item seven and higher, score superior responses two, that exceeds the task requirement. Standard score response one, meets task requirements and all inadequate or eligible, ill eligible, illegible responses, zero. Um, so here's uh, practice scoring, write a good sense that describes what is happening in this picture. The mother bird is feeding her baby worms. The bird has a worm. This is the bird. Ah, so this of course is a two point response of exceptional, much more detail. The bird has a worm, one point, this is a bird, not adequate. So a way to look at that. Write a good sentence that tells what the girl is doing. So here's some samples of how you would score this. The girl is swing, that's one point. They have a lot of the elements. Jeepers, I cannot. The girl is playing on a swing at the park, two points. The girl is nice, zero points not eligible. Here is um, the adjusted block items. So <clears throat> when you select them, it's not based upon their age, it's based upon the items and how they do to know if you need to go on. So this is, oops, let me go back. This is one I think that can sometimes be confusing. So let's spend a little bit of time on this. Um, when a score falls in the shaded area on the scoring table, use the adjusted block item above to determine what additional items to administer. So you started with items seven through 18, that's where you judged, right? So if after giving items seven through 18, the examinee earns four points, see note three. Give items one through six and base the final score on items one through 12. So you go to there, so if they didn't have that, so they got in the shaded area, they got a four. So anything in the shaded area, you go to three and you come here and you administer and then you base your sp scores off that. So Gail, I would like to stop there for a second and, and see if there's any questions on that. Cause that can be tricky. Do people understand that? Are there any questions on how to adjust that item block? This is the part that becomes a little tricky on items. People may ask, can I go back and re-administer if I missed it? Yeah, you can. I have done that where I've calculated, I scored it later and I looked at it and I calculated it wrong because sometimes I try to calculate it in real time, but the score is so close. I have had to go back and re-administer some items. You know, I try to do that as soon as possible. Not a lot of difference of time. There are certain tests. I pay a lot of attention to this test because this is the one that will give me this is the one that I have to go back and usually administer more items, you know? So I wanna make sure I get it right so I don't have to bring the kid in and try to do it all in one setting or go back in the testing session and maybe just grade it superficially. If there's a question, give more items because you don't have to calculate those items in the score. You're just giving the kid more test items than they really need. And I just try to avoid that as much as I can. So Gail? There are a couple of, um comments. Um, one is from Leslie. She says, thank you. I know my questions probably seem oh, repetitive. I'm sorry. Uh, disregard. 
from Kathleen. She says, we give the writing tests. However, our psychologist scores these. Yep. Is that a common practice? Yeah, sometimes it is. I think just because it's so important to make sure and it can be complicated. Um, I actually used to do that when I was a psychologist. I would have, I would suggest that that teacher scores it. And if they want to do that, I had my teacher score the items and then I would blindly score it beside them. And then I would go back to them on the scores that we differed on to say, why did we get a different score? And that's what I, that's how I did it. I always encourage in writing to have someone else scored if you have the time or look through them and say, is this right? Because it can be subjective. And so I don't think that's bad. However, if you defer that to them, you're not seeing some of those error patterns that you may want to see in their writing. So to just hand it off, if you're doing that, that's fine to make sure of accuracy, but make sure you're looking and, and following up with them to see what patterns of errors they had, because that's where you're going to know where to intervene is by the qualitative of what they're doing. That would be my only suggestion to that. So this is one you want to pay attention to. You want to know the scoring rules. You want to think about it because this is what trips people up. This is where we have to go back and to add more items. So understanding test six writing samples, this is where I would open the manual, spend some time understanding it, knowing the scoring a bit better and getting some assistance or help or understanding with it because it can be subjective. Okay. Um, did someone, okay, nope. nope I thought that's I it. Something. No okay. other questions. Okay, so scoring occurs after the initial block of items is administered. If the examinee scores falls in the shaded area, additional items need to be administered. A score falling in the shaded area at the top of a range means the block was too hard. A score falling in the shaded area at the bottom of the range means the block was way too easy. Final score may not include all items administered. Follow the directions on the adjusted item block. So that's what we were saying. You may give more items than you really want to. And that's why it's important to try to predict that, but you're not always going to get it. You're going to misjudge kids and it's fine. You're just going to have to make sure you get the right block of items to score. Okay. We're not doing that. <clears throat> Sentence writing fluency. A measure of written expression skills that contribute to the four clusters, um, as you can see. You administer sample items to all the examinees. This is a five-minute time test. Score reasonable sentences that use three stimulus words unchanged as correct for one point. The test name is was writing fluency in the Woodcock Johnson three. So it's the same test. They just changed the name of it to sentence writing fluency to differentiate it to what it actually is measuring. You administer all sample items. This is again, this is your teaching moment. This is where you're teaching and correcting to make sure they know what the task is so they can do it independently for five minutes or the best that we can. I believe this has aid restrictions. So I think if you're below first or second grade, you don't even administer this. That's something else to consider. Look at the tests that are age appropriate as well. This is a test that you don't give to kindergartners. It's just not, it's not appropriate. If the child is really low, you know, I get that question, should I administer this? If they're at an age where this is a suggested test, I would do the administration sample. And if they can't do it, you score to zero. You don't want to not administer something they can't do because it's going to elevate their score. If they're unable to do something that other six-year-olds can, you know, like six-year-olds, they probably can only do five or six of them in five minutes. It's not a high level. It's not like they're doing 20 of them. So if they can do one, if they can't do any, it matters because it's, it's really because there's kids in the standardization sample who weren't able to administer it. That's how they build it. So don't shy away from a test you know they can't do because it, it'll stop you before you even start it. If they can't do the samples and you can't get past that, it tells you what to do, but don't avoid it. Um, <clears throat> so administer samples A through D to all examinees. So the cake is good. Um, so you do this, you do it. So here's three words, good cake is, write a good sentence, the cake is good. 
then you help them with the pig is fat. Then you have them write the pig is fat. Good job. Then you go to C. Now you say, now look at this after you help them. Look at this picture and the words, this ball big. Use these three words and any other words you need to write a sentence about the picture. You may put the words in any order, but again, you are not to change the words. You provide the corrective feedback and practice as directed in your error or no response booklet, which is in there. And I think we have it here as well. Um, so when they're writing it, you give all the correction because there's a lot of, if they, if they change the word in any way, you want to correct it. You want to make sure they're not altering the meaning of what it is or the words to fit their sentence. They need to use these words exactly. Um, and they do that a lot. Um, so they'll add like um, plurals to, to, to fit it in a way and they need to keep it intact. If zero correct on samples item B through D, those three items after error correction, after you're doing all that, discontinue testing and record a score of zero for test 11. That's your stop gap to not give a, too hard of a test for a kid. If they don't have this skill, because this is a hard skill, this is one that kids struggle with, it's putting a lot of different things together. It has that stop gap to not administer it, but we wanna get that score. So we're not overestimating a child's ability because we didn't administer something we knew they would struggle with. If they score a one or more, you continue testing. Um, on test items, if three or fewer are correct after two minutes, discontinue the testing and record, a school, record the score in two minutes for the time. So again, another stop gap through the testing. We don't want to have, we don't want to take kids to a frustrational level if they don't have them, but it's important to get a score on this test to help us with interpretation, with eligibility and a lot of things. And I see teams skip tests that are perceived too hard, but we need those numbers because they matter for high stakes eligibility and those type of things. Test 14 editing. Um, this is a measure of writing skill that contributes to the basic writing skills cluster. I don't see this test administered as often. I'm seeing it more and more with older kids, um, but it's a, good, it, it's a good measure of their understanding of writing from looking at it from a different lens. Again, you administer the sample items A through D to all examinees, then select appropriate starting points. <clears throat> the basal and ceiling rules, six lowest correct on item one, or the six highest correct or last item. You test by complete pages. You do not read any words for the examinee after sample items have been administered. So they do this task on their own. Um, I want to ride with them as a sample. To receive credit, examinee must identify and correct the error. If the examinee locates the error but does not correct it, say, how would you correct that mistake? I got to move. So that's editing. Spelling of sounds test 16. Another one I don't see always given, but is a good one. It fits with the phoneme grapheme knowledge cluster. So this is a different, this is something else. If you're looking, when I was asked about word attack, this would be a test that I would give. If they scored poorly on word attack and I could see that, I may be inclined to give test 16. I may not have started the testing session wanting to give test 16, spelling of sounds, but because of some of the things I saw in earlier items, I may want to administer this based upon the question we had earlier about word attack, because this helps us with that phoneme graphing knowledge cluster, which is important for kids to be figuring out words and spelling words and all of that. So you select appropriate starting point based upon what you know. Basal and ceiling rules, six lowest, six highest. It's not by complete pages. It's because you're asking them to spell. There's an audio recording for item six and higher. I've been doing, I used to give those, but I've been really utilizing that more so it's pronounced correctly and it follows the standardization. If there's an audio recording, I highly encourage. Um, I think there are, I think it is allowed to do it through yourself, but I would practice it to make sure you're not influencing or pronouncing things incorrectly that could influence a lower score or higher score. So as much as you can, use those audio recordings. Um, items may be repeated upon request, so you can repeat them. Starting point for preschool to grade three. So this is a good preschool younger kid test. 
I'm going to ask you to write some letters. I will tell you the sound the letter makes. Then you say the sound and write the letter here. And you point to your blank space. Let's try one. Write the letter that makes the s sound as in sand. And the correct, so you get the correct is the S. Say the sound, not the letter name. When a letter appears to between slash marks, so that you want to do the sound. So that gives you the the the, the phonetic sound of the letter. Okay. Um, number one, say the sound, then write the letter that makes the t sound as in top. Um, does not so you have your if they do not repeat the sound, say the say the sound before you write it. So you want them to say the sound, then write it. Examinees are asked first to say the sound or a non-word and then write it. Score is based on only the written response. So if you're if they're not doing it and they're writing it, it just helps them to make sure that they're subvocally so kind of hearing what they're doing and using those those multi-sensory cues that they have of and not just relying on what they're hearing. Um, but it's only scored on the written response. If they're just not doing the sound or they're not doing it and they're doing the task, then you're just gonna score on the written response, but that's to help them make sure they're hearing the sounds. Starting point for grade three to adult. Um, so it's a different starting point, different items. I'm gonna ask you to spell some words that are not real words, they are non-words. Non-words may sound like bip, oist, mib. Try to spell the non-word in a way that you think it would be spelled if it were a real word. Listen carefully. I will say the non-word twice. Then you say the non-word and you write it on the line. Only acceptable, only acceptable correct responses are listed in the test book. So they, it's not an exhaustive, it, it's, it's the list that, are, that is there. The items are scored one or zero. Do not penalize the examinee for saying the non-word or mispronouncing it. Non-word first or mispronouncing it. Saying the word first is designed to help with spelling. It's used for qualitative information only. So you can hear how they're, are they hearing and saying the sounds correctly? So you probably have seen that where they can't pronounce it or they're pronouncing sounds wrong and they think they're saying it right, but they may be substituting a, a b sound with a p sound. And so they hear the b, b as a p, p. And you can hear that and then they write it qualitative. They're not differentiating. They're not hearing that different. That would be something I would want to look into. I talk to my speech path about it and say, hey, are they discriminating between sounds? Can they do that? How can they do this test if they're having trouble dis discriminating between similar sounding sounds that are very similar in where they're being produced? Again, I would advise, not myself, but I would go to a speech path or someone who really knew this and ask for some support. Do not penalize for poor handwriting, qualitative. Again, if you can see they're saying it right, they seem like they're doing it, and they're just handwriting, it's not penalized, you wanna get clarity on it, but we're not penalizing for that. We penalize them for their handwriting in other places and that sort of thing, not here except reverse letters unless they become a new letter. So B's and D's, um, the big one, right? You have to penalize for that because it changes everything. Um, if you're hearing that they're doing it, it's a reversal, I would note it. But again, that's gonna impact their academics, right? If you know it's different, but they're gonna get that counted wrong. They're gonna, going through life and having that mispronounced changes a lot of things, that changes the context. So it's important that those reversals are counted um, and not just given credit for because you know they, they understood it, they just have problems with reversals. We've got to get those reversals because they can have other problems down the road. Um, the two cluster of written language achievement, including spelling of single words, quality of expression, and reading and writing, um, spelling and writing examples, strong reliability, the three cluster of written language of achievement, including spelling of single words, fluency, quality of expression, goes to the reading, writing, cluster of um, the general writing and reading, and cognitive processing speed. So this weighs on a lot of processing speed as well, again, because of this writing fluency. 
Uh, basic writing skills, again, is just that reading and writing abilities. It's the spelling and editing. That's what it really weighs on. Again, processing speed because of the writing fluency and the general reading and writing are the clusters um, of those cognitive factors. Um, that factor analysis, if you know that stuff, that's these factors. Uh, written language summary. Um, the test includes five measures, various aspects of written language. We went through each of those spelling, writing samples, sentence writing fluency, editing, and spelling of sounds. Provides four clusters of performance. So you have those four clusters. Contributes to the phoneme and grapheme knowledge cluster, spelling of sounds, and word attack. So that's a good test for young kids is that and it, it weighs in on some of that, that phoneme and grapheme knowledge um, that's there. And again, spelling, spelling of sounds are all really good measures, right? I always say reading is the input of this reading and writing, of this general language arts. And when we write it, it's the output of it, right? But it's all related. So reading and writing can really be connected and you can look in to help it inform you of how they did on some of the reading tests, if they're struggling with some of the writing. I think those are, math kind of sits out there, but it, but it can factor in there. So um, sometimes understanding how kids spell really helps us understand how they read and vice versa. And so it's important to look at that globally and compare and contrast across tests as well, um, which we're gonna go into. So what do you do with these clusters for editing? Um, here's some instructional strategies, um, a lot of just things you can look into. You'll get these slides, some, just some instructional strategies to consider. Again, there's more, um, teach revision skills, guided proofreading. I don't know if we do enough of having kids edit their own, you know, I'm out of the classroom, but it's a good skill to see what they understand about that. Can they edit something is really good about understanding what their knowledge of it is. Written expression, analyze writing fluency to determine can they sustain concentration, how they respond, how automatic they are, what their errors are, and reading and writing and spelling, I mean, reading and spelling skills. Writing samples attitudes toward writing that comes out a lot. I see they're basic, very basic writing. They're not writing lengthy paragraphs. I think if there's a knock on writing samples, they don't have to write a multi-paragraph like essay, um, which a lot of, which is a requirement anymore. I think if there's a weakness of the Woodcock Johnson, it's that. Um, so you may have to get a writing sample somewhere and kind of take a look at how they did in these, these, these subtests to see how that's all being put together. Um, so it, you could, it'll understand oral language performance, their vocabulary, their organizational ability um, to help you really understand some of those consider, considerations. So the modifications, you can identify interests. They have plenty to write about, activate their background knowledge, do not penalize for spelling or punctuation errors, focus on the content. Use media to dictate, drag and speak, or something similar to that. Emphasize the writing process. Teach how to organize stories. Use graphic organizers. Again, multiple other things, but just some ideas of what you can do when you see these clusters. Instructional modifications um, for the writing fluency. Increase time to complete written assignments. Again, when you go back and you see why they were failing, that's going to help you identify some of these modifications. These are just generally, if it's low, but you got to see what they did here to help you determine what to do here is the point. And then some strategies, provide opportunities to write, teach skills in simple or complex sequence, conduct daily time writing activity, use sentence combining ex exercise, use sentence guides, et cetera. Um, clusters includes tests from different um, academic domains. So there's some cross domain clusters that are included, reading, writing, and math. We're gonna talk real quickly about that. Um, there's seven cross domain clusters, brief achievement and broad achievement, academic knowledge, academic skills, fluency applications, and this phoneme graphing knowledge. So they're taking tests from the reading, writing, and math, and they're creating new clusters 
you know, and, and we're talking about those, but the easy ones, academic fluency, right? We talked about reading fluency. We talked about sentence writing fluency, and we talked about math facts fluency. That can give you an academic fluency measure. If they're doing poorly on all fluency items, but they did okay in other areas, we're talking about a fluency problem. So they have pretty good content, but there's something with their processing speed and how they, they their ability to do academic tasks fluently. So let's talk more about what how they're built and what that can mean to some. So brief achievement. So if you wanna know, you could give test one, two, and three, and it gives you a brief achievement score. And it just says it's a reading test, a math test. It gives you an overall, a brief screening of achievement. If they're average in these basic things, you know, that's a good just screen. Does it tell you the whole problem? No, but it can be used as a brief achievement screening type of measure there um, with that. And we've done that for kids where um, high school kids, sometimes we want to get some academics and we don't want to give the whole test, but we want to get some basic numbers. That's where I think teams become very rigid in their selection of test items. The Wilcock Johnson has all these different clusters of how you can combine this. And it's really developed for you to look at the child and say, what cluster of tests should I give that I want to know? And how do I select those subtests to get the most information that's there? Not just giving the same set of tests. It's to inform. And it can help you do that. Broad achievement. So this has nine tests. So you can just take it. You can give these three, these three, to just give a broad academic test. I like these for reevals personally. We're not we're not thinking the child's going to be testing out, but we, you know, this is upper middle school, you know, upper elementary middle school. They're in good intervention. We have a good handle of what's going on, but we want to make sure that we're staying on top of it, making sure we're seeing this. And this might be a good time to give some of these broad achievement scores to kind of vary it, to not to give the standard battery, just to make sure that we're continuing to have that information to see where those things are at. If something wacky comes out of it, you might want to go and give an additional test in one of these domains. It should be a, a fluid process. Um, it, it's built to be more fluid than, than we use it, I should say. Gail, go ahead. A um, couple of things. Um, one, I just want to remind people that there will be a link to the evaluation posted in the chat um, closer toward the end of the session. And we will be doing a drawing for anybody that um, replies on the evaluation. And I'll tell you more about that toward the end of this. And before you get too far down the road, this is your 30 minute warning, Dan. <laughs> and um, I have one question, kind of a general question that you might want to address before you go on. And that is um, between one school psychologist and three special education teachers, how should we go about ensuring we are calibrating our administration for the greatest level of consistency and reliability? Well, this is Dan Mayer's opinion, okay? I, I do not represent the Wyoming Department of Education. This is not anything that um, for Region 5 BOCES. Dan Mayer as a school psychologist, if I was one of those school psychologists, I believe that we should be training and discussing in in-service time, test administration each year. Going through the tests we're gonna use, reminding people of scoring, having discussions, calibrating amongst each other now and again, using some professional development time to communicate on that. And that's what we did. And it seemed to be, or in my past, that's what we did when I was part of that. Just to have some open dialogue with that, we would train all of our staff, special ed staff as part of our in-service. Now this is years ago, but I would do the training on the Woodcock Johnson. That's why I feel like this is important. I wanted to make sure, because we assume people when they come out have had a wealth of knowledge and test and measurement, but some of these tests we're asking them because they have a special ed masters, they, they may not have administered. And so I think we need to make sure that people are comfortable with it. They have training on the administration. I think we need to tend to that. I think there's not many things that we've learned now. If it was a reading curriculum, I think we would have teachers go to in-services if they adopted a new re reading curriculum. We would go in and make sure we were tending to that, to those changes. 
And I would just want to make sure that people felt good and do some reminders. And that's what we did. We would spend a day talking about the tests we used. And I think that would be a good way. We also would calibrate with each other um, on writing samples and different things to make sure we were on the same page of how we were scoring it. That's what I would do. I would do some professional development, use some in-service time to spend some time. For me, I would say this holds, and Gail knows how, how I feel about this. So this is something I'll probably go on a little too long on, but this matters so much. We determine eligibility of kids on these numbers. I have been part of teams where math errors were the result of kids qualifying or not qualifying by how they added the total. To me, that's this is high stakes. And I don't know if it's always appreciated in that way. This is something that people feel like anybody can do. You just read the manual. And it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And we wonder why we're not utilizing these tools to help inform because we don't spend the time in them to understand them. This Woodcock Johnson is a beast. I mean, I, I don't want to lose people in the interpretation, but there's a 90 page interpretation. You can start making inferences on how clusters relate to each other. If you read some of the clinical interpretation that Nancy Mathers, who Nancy Mather, who's from University of Arizona is the big person for the Woodcock Johnson now. And she's borrowed me these slides because I think she just believes you can diagnose dyslexia in this. If you learn how these tests and tools and the scores work, you can do a lot of interpretation if we spend the time understanding it. But if it's given to you and get these numbers and they don't mean anything to you, that's the hard part. So we need to spend more time talking about these things. And we feel like it's, you know, when I did this, I, I was very, when I was thinking about doing this, I almost went away from doing what I just did today because I want, because everybody wants to know what the interpretation side is. But I don't think you can do that until you understand what the test is doing. What is it actually measuring? What's the more details? So those are some thoughts on that, I guess. I went maybe a little bit down a rabbit hole, but I just feel like we don't spend enough time in this kind of conversation, but there's such a high stakes to it that we need to really understand it. And I think it can really help kids. I believe that. I believe it can. I think we, this doesn't, this isn't superior to what a classroom teacher sees on a running record for reading. Every bit of information matters for a student. And we need to take all that information in and see what jives and what doesn't and figure out why those numbers aren't because that's probably an intervention or where the problem is. We've got to think about it differently. We often say, well, your Woodcock Johnson's wrong or your Dibbles is wrong or your Ames Web is wrong. And this is, no, 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 nothing's wrong. All data is good data. It's telling us something. If you choose to look further, you'll find it. If you say things are wrong or that, then you're, you're missing something. This is only information and take it for what it is. It's just information. But if we're not administering it right or we're making errors and we're making educational decisions, it, it is important to make sure we're doing it correctly. So. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> you bet. So academic knowledge, science, social studies, and humanities, we haven't talked about those. Um, it talks about those various knowledge of academic knowledge. So it gives you that comprehension. Um, serves as the ability score for an ability achievement comparison. Woodcock Johnson believes that your academic knowledge should be your basis of intra individual achievement. So they use this academic knowledge to do their comparative of what's discrepant and what's not. Um, in these, the examinee is not required to read and they're orally presented by the examiner. <clears throat> and so here's a little bit more about these. It's a domain specific knowledge that contributes to the academic cluster. And they ask science questions, some general science. You present them all orally and you ask their answer for it. So here's some examples, measures aspects of anatomy, biology, chemistry, geology, medicine, and physics. Listen, what organ in the body pumps blood? What is the name of the center of the retina where a person has the best or sharpest vision? So some pictures have pictures, they're orally, and some are shown in text. Social studies, same thing under social studies. 
<clears throat> looks at history, economics, ge geography, government, and psychology, complete all the queries indicated in the test book. What does this person do? What is what in what city was the first modern Olympic held, etc. And again, humanities, very similar measures aspects of art, music and literature, just gives them a general knowledge of what their general knowledge is, right. Um, <clears throat> and then you can, what's this picture? What are these musical notes? Listen carefully, finish what I say, Marietta Little Lamb. Um, Includes three tests, each measuring a basic skill. So academic skills, um, it looks at letter word ID spelling. It's more of the skills, right? So you're looking at the skills of reading, skills of written language and skills of calculation. And it provides an overall index of the basic skills. So if you see that skills, it's going into these skills. Fluency, I already talked about this one. The fluency items, it gives you a academic fluency number. So it combines those to say fluency. Academic applications, so it's art, can you apply it? Applied skill in a different achievement. So they use math as a pride problems, reading, passage comp. Can you use these skills? And we're gonna take your skills away and can you just do these? So it's very important writing samples. Provides a broad measure of applied academic skill. <clears throat> and then phoneme graphing knowledge. We talked about this, it's word attack and spelling of sounds. Yields one cluster of phoneme graphing knowledge. It requires both the phonology and orthography. Um, um, and it provides insight to examine these knowledge of sounds and symbols. So <clears throat> just a real summary, we went through all the testing items. Um, so it provides three forms of the standard battery, eliminates overexposure of items, supports team approaches, offers new reading tests, clusters for more comprehension, collects important qualitative information on checklists on the test record, provides academic knowledge, achievement comparison procedure, offers one extended battery for the use of all three forms of the standard battery, and is normed with the Woodcock-Johnson cognitive test and oral language test. Any questions before we move on to a little bit more of an interpretation? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. <clears throat> okay. So what I want to go into a little bit is a little bit of an interpretation. This is a whole nother training that can be discussed. But one test score that I want to bring forward that we have is the RPI. Um, so <clears throat> when you look at interpretation, the, the, the Woodcock Johnson gives you all sorts of tests and it's, um, or I'm sorry, all sorts of scores. And like I told you at the beginning, I'm not, I didn't want to go through all the standard scores and what that means. You know, when we get more into interpretation, when we understand what the tests are, you know, then we can. One test measurement that the Woodcock Johnson has that I want to spend a little time on is this RPI score. This test has standard scores, mean 100 being average, standard de deviation of 15 on each side. It has percentile ranks. It has grade equivalencies, age equivalencies. So there's a lot of interpretation that you're probably familiar with, with the Weschler and testing their standard scores, percentile ranks. Wilcock Johnson has a unique measurement that they use is called the RPI. And the RPI reflects the individual's proficiency on tasks, which the average age or grade mate has 90% proficiency. It predicts the level of success on similar tasks. This test score seems to be the one that people don't understand. And I think as a special ed teacher, it's the one that you may want to understand a little bit better because I think it can help you. Um, Yoshi has an RPI of three out of 90 on broad written language. This means he is predicted to perform with 3% success on those writing tasks that average grade mates would perform with 90% success. Bennett has an RPI of 98 over 90 on math reasoning. This indicates his performance is advanced with him, predicted to perform with 98% success when average grade mates attain 90% success with math reasoning tasks. So that's what this RPI score has. So when you're looking at it, and if I don't know where you're at, if you're at school or someplace, you have a Woodcock Johnson handy, look at your students' RPIs. 
when you're done with this, you get this, go to the end of the slide deck and start looking at those RPIs across these scores. If you have a generated report and you give the Woodcock Johnson, you have these numbers, but it's often no one interprets it. No one talks about them um, that I've seen. So what is it? What is it doing? What is it predicting this RPI? It's the relative proficiency index represents a person's quality of performance on reference tasks. RPIs, you can say, are almost like a Snellen index, which describes the quality of visual acuity. So that's like if you have a visual acuity 20, you know, 20 over 20. So it's very similar. It's comparing what that average typical person should see, right? Because you can, I don't know if a lot of people know, but your acuity can be better than 20 over 20. It can be, I forget the 20 over or 10 over 20. So you can see, and so it's there. It's not, it's this quality of the performance that you can base it off. Half of people do. It's like how they measure acuity for vision. It's very similar. The Snellen index, so 20 over 200 means the individual has to be 20 feet to see what a person with normal vision can see at 200 feet. The relative proficiency index, 20 over 90 means that the individual has 20% mastery of proficiency on the task, which average age or grade peers have 90% mastery. So it can give you that. So when you look at a standard score and it's low average, well, we'll go into that, provides a criterion reference index of a person's visual acuity. Oops, provides an individual, I can't even see that, uh, mastery of a person's um, performance. So it gives that percent, so very similar. I don't know why that's. So you can see that these, an RPI of 100 over 90, very advanced, functional level, very advanced. So you can see 98 to 90, advanced, 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 advanced. Then you can see 67 to 90, 82 to 90, limited to, to average, mildly impaired, um, mildly delayed to age appropriate, severely depleted. So, you can see these scores give you another level of proficiency, their functional level and their development or the level of delay in, in an in a academic area. Um, development, instructional zones develop, let me go back up here. Developmental instructional zones go hand in hand with RPI. They reflect the range from easy or independent level to the difficulty or frustration level. So easy to difficult, um, 96 to 90, 75 to 90, and structural 90 to 90. To glean this information, we look at the age grade profiles, which is next. So we take Justin, who's a student, and again, there's more to this that can be, but I think it's important to know that this score exists and to think about it. So here's Justin, he's a fifth grader, as he's a, at fifth grade, his oral language, um, his RPI was 94 out of 90 percentile rank on that is 70th percentile. Here's his age band, his band of these academics. Total achievement, 67. Achievement, um, total achievement, oh, broad reading, 24 out of 90. Broad math, 96 out of 90. Broad written language, 51 out of 50. Basic reading skills, five out of 90, math calculation. So this is provided to you on the Wilcox Johnson test, but you can get a good sense of where kids are at on these bands of where their instructional zones are, the developmental zones based upon that. And you can get that. So you can find developmental and instructional zones for these um, students. Some of these, it goes in further. Some of these content areas have wider bands than narrow bands. The narrower the band, the more we know about that skill, the larger band, it's uh, the varying degree of development is, is wider. So one score either way can really have that. So it's a wider age band. The tighter it is, the more knowledge we have of where you really wanna have these kids at their placement based upon their testing on these scores. So as you're looking into interpretation, um, we're not going through what the meaning is and how to do that and asking questions back and forth. That's a training that would take some time afterwards, but it's something to start looking into and asking and reading about, because I think it could be very helpful as you're trying to determine, like, I remember a student, we would identify and teachers would say, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where, like, what I should begin. Well, this can help you with some actually grade level of where some academic skills, real quickly, you look at this, you can kind of tell where his needs are 
based upon these is relative proficiency and percentile ranks and age bands of kind of where you can instructly meet the student. Um, what's too hard, what's too easy, what's not enough. And, and an often overlooked um, measurement of the Woodcock Johnson um, that needs to be looked into a little bit more when we're really looking at interpretation. Um, it's like the fifth step of interpretation is really looking at these scores. Now, I'm only talking to you about the RPI um, just to, to, to make you aware of it, just to talk to you a little bit about it. But the RPI should be interpreted in relation to the student's overall standard score in those areas, their percentile rank, and you take all those things together to help you make that decision. So you put all these pieces in, um, but that's, like I said, that, that's, that's a mouthful. That, that's, that's really getting into um, advanced looking at this. The last thing I have, and I've, I'm impressed that I've got this and we'll stop and ask some questions about all of this at the end. So consider the variables. You know, this is another, this is step six in the interpretation. So I haven't gone through all the interpretation of this, but one of the final steps that I at least want to leave you with, know about the RPI, start paying attention to that and seeing what that means and ask questions. But step six, consider the variables that may facilitate or inhibit the individual's cognitive or academic performance. Facilitators, inhibitors, observations and reports, informal work samples, and error analysis. We don't see, we take the scores, we look at them, but we don't start asking this. And that's where you can get, how did they do on that task? How did they have that? It's not, it's much more than just the standard score on that. You wanna get that other information. So if you want things verified by informal work samples, you wanna look at the errors that they had when they were completing the task to help you understand why they may be failing at it, it's just much more than giving the item, scoring it up, putting the raw score in the computer and getting a standard score of 82 and looking at everybody and say, well, do they qualify? I think there's a lot more level of interpretation. Once you get there and this spits out these comprehensive reports, there's a lot of information that can be utilized uh, moving forward. So <clears throat> that's all I have. Um, Fast and furious, that leaves us uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, for any housekeeping you have, Gail, I'm, I'm willing to answer any questions that I did not um, get to in this presentation with the remaining time. Um, uh, well, let me do some housekeeping and we'll leave the remainder of time open for questions. Um, thank you, Dan. That, I learned so much from that and I have done the Woodcock Johnson, but it's it's a great refresher and also great to know about the changes for the uh, Woodcock Four. Um, I just wanna remind everybody that before you sign off, please complete an online evaluation for today's session. And I'll tell you why we are gonna be um, doing a drawing and I'm gonna hold up my phone because I don't want to risk sharing the screen. There's this book called Essentials, Essentials of Woodcock Johnson Four Tests of Achievement. And it's written by Nancy Mather. You're familiar with this. Dan's shaking his head. And it gives you um, advice on avoiding common pitfalls. But what I like about it is it's really conveniently formatted for rapid reference. So I know everybody has the administration manual and we all know um, what that looks like, but this book, um, we're gonna do a random drawing from everybody that submits an um, evaluation and one of you will win this book and we will ship it to you. So please um, complete that. It takes about a minute to complete, but it really must <coughs> guide um, our planning of future professional development events. And I just want to say that throughout this presentation, I've had several people in the chat and some have chatted me privately and some people have texted me. Um, what a great presentation it is and, and hoping that we can get additional Woodcock Johnson um, training throughout the year. So we'll be 
talking to Dan um, about that. Um, we've also posted links to the PTSB and STARS sign-up sheets. So if you want to receive continuing ed credit for attending today, you'll need to click on one of those links. And finally, there's a registration link in the chat for um, upcoming WAVES sessions. So if you're interested in, I think we have another one um, this month. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact title of it. Leslie Bechtel Van Orman is presenting it. Tom, jump in, help me out with the title. Yes, Gail, that is the uh, Visual Impairment Eligibility Determination, uh, which will be on December 10th from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Thank you. And you can register for that. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to Dan, and we will keep the session open so everybody can access the links and put your comments in the chat. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to attend today and um, stay safe. So Dan, I'll turn it over to you. All right. <clears throat> yeah, so um, if there's anything I haven't covered or anybody would like to ask, you can put it in the chat or, and Gail can help me monitor that or you can unmute yourself if you're able and just ask away. Um, I was trying to see if there was anything I missed. Um, there's been a lot of Oh, at the end of this, I would like to know if you recommend any certain classes to help correct some of these various problems, spe specifically reading disabilities. So um, <clears throat> I wonder if I, Christine, or if you're on, I can see your name there. Do you want to unmute and clarify that? Um, a little bit more of specifically what I can answer for that? Yes. Think, yeah. I'm working with a group of students um, uh, having difficulty with reading, and it's a new job for me. Okay. And just at this point, with the little bit of testing I've been reviewing, I'm tending to see that they have not got phonemic awareness. What is there a specific class or something that you would recommend for this? Is yeah, yeah. Um, a class, you know, that's something. There's been a lot of presentations on that. You know, when you get into the finer details of phonemic awareness and that, I really look to my colleagues in speech pathology that. You know, a lot of the tests that measure, the tests I give to measure phonemic awareness and those sort of things um, are really speech language tests. So we're starting to use a lot of their tools um, in some of our tests and measurement. So one thing I would think of doing is if you have any resources like that or know of any, I would have a conversation with them. Um, but I think there's a lot of books that have been written on that. Um, I think there's a lot of self-study that can happen. I think there's a lot of different resources. There's a lot of tools. There, we're, we're getting to know a lot about this area. It's, it's pretty wide, and I think there might be some differing but opinions, but I think really what I would say in that is really understanding, finding something that can help you, maybe a test that dives into it deeper. So you understand where your kids are at a little bit deeper than where that's at. Because these tests just kind of give you the general vicinity, but the Woodcock-Johnson isn't a standalone like phonemic awareness test. If I have struggles with that, what I do as a psychologist or with my colleagues, I give a test. The test I like is the comprehensive test of phonological processing. It has a phonological awareness subtest, it has a rapid naming sub or tests, and it has a phonological memory. It's all based upon sounds and symbols and how kids are putting sounds together. Can they discriminate? Can they produce? And um, understanding that um, is probably gonna help you. And then matching strong interventions 
we're where kids are struggling with that and helping them develop those skills in that. Are there classes specifically? I'm not sure, but I know there's a lot of good books. I, uh, I'm trying to remember her name. Lu is it Louisa Motes? Someone I think that has been brought into Wyoming. I think she has a lot on that. I think of um, uh, Dr. Kilpatrick, who's been into Wyoming. He has a book on reading. Any book on reading that talks about it, you know, it's going to talk about how you, because that's the foundation of reading, right? It's one of the foundations, I should say. And so there's been a lot that's been thought about that, but for specific classes, I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, I think, it, you know, there's different directions that you can point. And if that's, I think my email on the slides are there, you can reach out to me if you like, and I can maybe point you in a more specific direction um, if that doesn't answer it. Um, Other questions? Oh, that, so there we go. Orton Gillingham, yeah. Oh, C top. So that C top is the comprehensive test of phonological processing, and it's the second edition. So it's the second edition. And there's others. There's the PALS. And there's a lot of different training programs. Orton Gillingham's one that I've heard of. Uh, I'm trying, boy, I'm out of practice on this, um, of what the latest and greatest is. Um, I moved into more of the behavioral side of stuff. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of really strong programs that are out there to remediate those. Um, but again, remember, I think sometimes getting a little bit more information might be helpful. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Dan likes questions. I do. He does. A plug on the book, um, as people are thinking or having that, I do know some of that book. She, they have some really good clinical interpretation chapters in this, really talking about scores and how to put them together and how different scores will match with each other. Uh, there is a level of interpretation that's pretty deep with this. If you, if you choose to go there with this test, you can. You can do a lot. If you really dive into it and really understand it, it becomes a tool. The more familiar you come with the tool, people ask me, do I vary tests? I don't vary tests often. I like to get to know a test and really deeply understand it. Because the better I understand it and I see those trends with it, it helps me make those interpretations. Um, and I have found that academic tests don't vary much. They're pretty much the same. They nuance like on writing and stuff like that, but they're all pretty much the same and they have strengths and weaknesses. And once you know one really well, you can really infer when you get into other ones. You always wanna have one that you really know, dive deep into it, really understand what it all means and the pieces of it will really help you. Um, Hi, Dan. This is Cassinda Fleming from um, the Wyoming Department of Education, and I have a question. Yeah. Are there any um, guidelines for how long various interventions should be um, tried before determining that something else, you know, you should move on to another intervention? There are, and I don't know if I know some of those hard, fast rules off the top of my head, but there are some, and my understanding, I'm gonna talk in some generalities here, that it's more about the data points, the trend lines, than it is really time per se. My comment on that is, so you wanna make sure that you're actively monitoring the progress to know that. And if a student um, isn't finding success, what I've been really trying to talk to people about is not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, meaning, that we change interventions often. And a lot of times we have to say, do we need to vary that strong intervention? Or do we have the right intervention? Did we match the intervention with the skill deficit we're identifying with a kid? So sometimes we're not matched well. <clears throat> and so we need to understand that if we're not seeing progress. 
But then do we need to do a variation? Is the intervention right? And we need to supplement it. And a colleague of mine, Bart Lyman, has been doing a lot of work with the um, National Center for Intensive Intervention. And they really, you know, really promote an approach called database individualization and where you use data in this basis, but we're not eliminating resources, we're adding them. And it's really teaching people because oftentimes we do, when I was a director or school psychologist, we try kid in an intervention and we change it. And the intervention might've been right, but we don't ever change the dosage. We never chase the intensity, the frequency, the, 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 the person delivering it. We never take those other factors. We always blame the intervention. And there's a lot of things that can be done before we change it. So I didn't answer your question directly, but I think there's a lot of factors you need to consider into to make sure that you're giving that <clears throat> with fidelity, um, before we really start making those instructional changes. And I'm seeing people really start to, what I say, pump the brakes on that. So we're not changing things around over and over and over again and really utilizing more of our approach and trying things and modifying strong interventions based upon that kid's need. That sometimes the tools are right, but what we have to do with that tier two intervention to make it a tier three intervention is add something to it or maybe do something special for that child. So time frames on changing interventions, I would just advise that you look at everything and not just focus on that intervention in that way. I read a study years ago that really influenced my thinking around interventions. And it was fast forward, ironically, early on. And I know the state's doing some work around fast forward. But one of the reasons that fast forward and some of these interventions are effective is that to do it correctly, you have to do it for like an hour or two a day. And the intensity and duration that the kids are in, in the intervention, we, th we give the credit to the intervention, but some of these interventions require an hour above what they're getting every day. And so it's really the duration and frequency that we're delivering this on top of what they're getting is the important piece. Yeah, you wanna match the intervention. If they have a fluency problem and you're doing phonemic awareness, you've got a problem there. You gotta do a fluency intervention. So that's one problem. <clears throat> but also you want to be able to adapt what you're doing and understand why the child's struggling with that intervention. And I don't think we do that well to try things before we take it out. So the hard and fast rules of switching, I think is more about data points and trying things and ensuring that this is not the right fit before we change it is how I would answer that. Thank you. Those were some really good just uh, considerations um, for people to take. So thank you. That was helpful. You bet. Other questions? Looks like we still have 25 people on um, in the meeting. I always wonder, are they people that just walked away from their computer or are they wanting more? I'm sure they're all wanting more, Dan. Um, uh, I, I'm happy to stay on. If people want to check out, that's good. If people want to ask stuff, I'll hang on for 10, 15 minutes. And once people are gone, I'll, I'll, we'll know to leave, Gail. So if people want to yeah. check out and ask questions, I'll hang on for a minute and um, just waiting for any last minute nuggets of wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for your participation. Like I said, I'll hang on. You can check out if you want. I appreciate everybody's great questions. Um, I just appreciate everybody's attendance and great questions. And um, my contact information is there. For those of you that know me, you know you can reach out to me. For those of you who don't, you can reach out to me. I'll respond. So thank you, Dan.